Yeah, he must have rammed it and hit that target right center of the body, and then picked it up and sh- you know shredded all the parts apart, and then just left that target stuck on his head. Buck was a straight up murderer. Out of He'd already mind. killed one buck that morning. He was looking for the next. That's crazy. And we're back hey. on our podcast, episode 53, first episode of the new year. Yeah. Welcome to 2022. Let's begin. Let's begin. Yeah. So, yeah, man, new year. Um, excited about it for for not only Hunter, but obviously, like, we're, we're getting into that time where season's kind of fading and, you know, we're thinking sheds, we're thinking management. I'm what? grasping for optimism at this point. So, <laughs> Grasping. It's kind. Of, I know it will come back around, but it's like I'm just. Um, I'm grasping tags, dealing <laughs> with the fact that yeah, the season is almost over, and <sighs> uh, we're, we're, it's kind of a reset here. It's been a tough one too. Like I, I actually really do like the late season, just because it's back to bed food, bed food pattern, and really evening hunts. Like don't even hunt the morning, but dude, like all the deer are dead in the United yeah. States. Like, <laughs> I think we like the idea of the late season. Like, well, it's been oh, sixty it's degrees. Bad food, thermal cover, you know, blinds. But it's it's tough, man. If you don't take, if you don't pay yeah. special or put, you know, designate some effort into setting up a late season, um, mm-hmm. and even even if you do, you know, there's not no guarantee there's. Well, be I mean, luck there. if you add your late season, which I have a couple places I feel really confident about, it's been sixty degrees and rain every day. Like they're they're not doing late season things like they normally do. No. There is no bed food, bed food, because it's 20 degrees and they need to get calories. We've had some, <clears throat> like, not not very good hunting weather I mean, throughout the month of December. At least here in Pennsylvania. It's and been I, warmer than November, I think. Yeah, in most of these places, it's, it was the warmest Christmas, like, on record in most cases. Yeah. And, like, we haven't had an accumulating snow yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, maybe a dusting, like, one more. It's January. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we're really crazy in terms of how that all sets up, but um, which is not that uncommon. It's just no, it no, hasn't no. really been cold. It's gonna come at some point. We'll we'll get hit probably with a just you know a ten day cold streak where it's like sub ten degrees or something in our area, and you yeah, know, that'll that'll do. It. But I mean, like last week, I showed that you know I found sheds already, which is crazy. There was a bunch of comments, people saying, yeah, like this buck shed this date, this buck shed this date. So, I mean, they're dropping, you know, I'm not saying to go out there and like start looking, you know, hard, but you know, bucks are shedding. So be careful if you are out there late season hunting for does, especially that, you know, could be a shed buck. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no magical 225 pound swamp donkey does out there. They probably have pedicles. Uh, They might be out there, but (laughs) yeah, you're going to want to look. Um, I guess before we get started on today's podcast, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, last week, uh, Primo's Buck Roar giveaway is Austin Jaeger is the winner. The Jaegermeister. It's pronounced Jaeger. I believe uh, it's Yogging. Yogging, yeah. Just run. So we wrote yeah. Austin, send us your info on that side. Uh, this week, we're going to do another Fusion X uh, Stealth Cam giveaway. And to previous winners, we apologize for, we're getting the stuff. In yeah, the Christmas coming. delayed. So we're going to get some of out there. But Christmas. Yeah, Christmas. Uh, so yeah, so Stealth Cam Fusion X, so comment, review, like, kind of whatever you need to do there to get us aware of your existence for, for possible win. One of the things that we talked about yesterday and today is that we're kind of formulating this, uh, new 2022 guest list essentially of like who we'd like to have on the podcast. But I think part of that is we kind of would like to hear what you guys, uh, would like to see on the podcast, who you'd like to see. So maybe as your comment. If they've got a YouTube channel or something, or if it's on social, tag them. Like, tag them in the comment and say, hey, you know, love to see Dan Enfold on the podcast, Jeff Sturgis. Like, obviously, Jeff's been on, but, yeah, you know, that would be a cool way yeah, for us, us to, to cool. add people to our docket that, you know. Doesn't mean it will happen. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't mean doesn't mean they want to come on the podcast. But we'd love to know. Yeah, we would like to know who you want on the podcast. And and as kind of that prelude, um. I know last week we kind of built up the momentum that this week was Dan Enfault. Uh, the world's best farter has COVID. Mm. And so that could affect his farting ability. That was going to be our episode title, World's Best Farter. Oh, it still will be. when uh, Dan's still going to come on, but he's got to get Father. through. Yeah, he's got, he's got to get through the <laughs> COVID situation <laughs> here. So hopefully Dan uh, recovers quickly from that. But Speedy recovery. We, um, we pulled in another guy that I think is just as heavy on the public land side and also has a really cool 
avenue into um, tracking wounded deer with dogs. And mm-hmm. that's Shane Simpson. So I'm sure a lot of you guys who follow THP and Dan Enfold probably know who Shane Sim- Simpson is. Shane uh, Simpson. I did tell yeah. Colton before the podcast, he's not a real Simpson. Yeah, not related to Homer. No, <laughs> that we know of. <laughs> Um, but Shane is a guy that, you know, from a bow hunting perspective and a public land perspective has probably got some really cool intel on that side. But his big thing is, um, he's been traveling around with his dog Callie recently and has done a whole series on tracking wounded deer. And it's something that I, you know, I personally have never used. Um, and I've definitely have wounded my fair share (laughs) of deer, um but it's an interesting thing because like i don't even know the legality of it in most states still like i know there's some states you can do it some states you can't Mm -hmm. um obviously if it increases the odds of a recovery from a poor shot like i'm all for it like every effort possible to to recover that deer but i I think that uh like in ohio i believe the rule is that it has to be on a lead lead. yeah Yeah, it can can be like of a certain length but what they're trying to avoid i think is running runs with deer Mm -hmm. yeah deer with dogs yep Mm -hmm. makes sense yeah, so I mean that's a cool aspect though to I think to to kind of bring home here is like, you know, w- what does he see um, from a tracking standpoint? Because I do think well, it, even just from a hit bug standpoint, uh, yeah, most dog trackers that I've talked to, and I bet Shane's no exception, is extremely knowledgeable on like different types of hits and, and what you're going to see in terms of h- how they yeah, act. On, yeah, how on does a blood deer trail, behave? Whether they're they're betting frequently or they're just running all out or mm-hmm. you know anything in between. Yeah, Being finding nice like actually finding blood. Like I don't know if it's purely a scent tracking at some point. Dude, that's versus... a that's a big deal, man. Like after all of that work and all the preparation you put into you know pulling a hunt off, if you hit that thing and it's maybe not perfect, like that that can make or break. Uh, you bow hunt long enough, marginal shots are going to happen. Well, dude, yeah, you and I have been on blood trails for. Yes. Miles in yeah. some cases. And like yeah, this deer, we very easily could have given up on that deer several hundred yards in to say, hey, he's not bleeding. He's probably not hit. The, the reality though, dude, is if you, if you stick one of these things like in the cavity, it will die. They're going to die at some point. Yeah. More, more than likely. Yep. And, and you, you owe that animal everything to. Well, and that's kind of, first of all, I mean, not that I want to follow like massive blood trails, but I really like tra- trailing deer. Like, <laughs> See, I I know you do. And that's, this, this is like where our cool differences are. Like I love, like when we were on this trail, though, it was like nervous and frustrating it for two miles. Like the fact was like you would go and be like, man, like can't believe, oh, there's blood. And like, it's literally two miles into this and like narrowing in on the steer. Yeah. You know, and, and it's a part of it's the success of like, actually you put forth all that effort. And I say that mainly because I've been around enough people who don't put any effort into it like literally they'll walk to where they shot and they're like man no blood like i don't understand and they're not and it's like what do you mean well it's so easy to do um I, you know i've i've definitely done it as i was growing up and just coming up and it's like well if you're not sure of the hit like just me being honest like as a teenager and stuff like you, you don't want to like tell your dad that like oh, i made a bad shot and yeah. like we're gonna have to spend the next day or two blood trail on this thing like that's bad news for yeah um it goes from good news to bad news really quickly and so it's te- it's tempting to i mean we told a story here on this podcast even with Corey, where i'm like oh here's the arrow <laughs> yeah yeah and it's like yeah because yeah, that, you that does that and that shows like, my opinion of blood trail and it's like dude, i would like to avoid it if possible yeah well and i mean that's that's part of you know and maybe we get into some of the you know fixed blade expandables single bevel giant broadhead type stuff with shane and understanding like you know, are you seeing a trend here, you know, with crossbows versus bows? I know people will be like, oh, here comes the crossbow thing again. But, you know, are people making less ethical or more ethical shots with a crossbow? I mean, the fact is, if you could just use a scope and aim and shoot, like, I would think it's probably more effective. But I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like, if you take an 80-yard shot, it's going to be less effective. Yes. Yeah, it's an interesting topic. I mean, those crossbows definitely give you the ability to, to, to make – more lethal shots at a, at a distance and they're mm-hmm. i mean they're faster and stuff but I, I could see you would also there's also things that are out of your control that a sure. crossbow doesn't necessarily like oh there's plenty of things i mean deer reacts you hit a branch like a lot of things that can come you know broadhead male functions like there's a lot of things that can happen that just lead to not finding that deer um yeah yeah so, yeah, I think it'd be pretty cool. But anyways, we've got Shane Simpson on. We're going to talk public land. We're going to talk about trailing deer and go at it. Sweet. Let's bring him in. Hey. Uh, what's up, man? Hey, how's it going? 
Oh, not too bad, dude. Uh, we're just kind of opening up the floor there, and I think there's a lot of different ways that, you know, <clears throat> we kind of talked beforehand that this podcast couldn't necessarily go, but, um, you know, I, I think that for us, the the trailing aspect of... Let's let Shane introduce himself. All right. First. Yeah, yeah. Shane, just tell, tell us who you are and, like, what you're about, and just give us a little background for our listeners. Uh, all right. Uh, my name's Shane Simpson, and um, I deer hunt, turkey hunt, and I track deer with uh, my, well, I won't say blood tracking dog, it's a deer tracking dog, because we don't necessarily track blood, but I have a YouTube channel, and all, uh, I try to uh, video, you know, those tracks with, with my dog, Callie, and, and put it on YouTube, and, and try to explain it best I can with maps and stuff, so people can follow along and kind of get an idea of, you know, what what occurred on those tracks and the outcome. Very cool. What's your channel called? Uh, Shane Simpson on YouTube or Shane Simpson hunting. Um, Sweet. So pretty easy to find. Yeah. Or, Very cool. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. No, no, no. In oh, we always we always skip over that part, so I have to. In contrary to the accent, you're actually in Minnesota, even though you're a Southern boy by heart. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you hear my, if I go visit family, they, they say I've lost my accent. Obviously, <laughs> you guys can tell I have a little bit of Southern. I have lost it a little bit. Uh, I, I can tell by looking at my older videos. I sound more like Boomhauer back then and, and, and less like him now. Um, so it's being in Minnesota is wearing off on me a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Well, like we were just talking, you're like, yeah, it's five degrees out. And even here where we're at in Pennsylvania, it's like 60 this morning. Yeah. Yeah. I envy that, but it, it doesn't last too long. We usually get cold around January and uh, then it starts warming back up in February. And that, when I say warming up, when we get into the 20s or 30s, that's after you've been in the negative twenties and negative thirties for a couple of weeks, then yeah. um, you can go out in t-shirts and, and it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. It's amazing. It's amazing how, how drastically that Dude, you know, warmer that feels. I, I'll be interested to, uh, I've been doing, to, you'll get to know me here pretty quick, Shane. I've been taking cold showers for, are you still doing this yeah, thing? Yeah. Okay. Ice cold showers, uh, I don't know, six months or something at this point. My cold tolerance is, is way up. up. Is way up. Yeah, be, this will be my first winter. I'll be interested to see how. No I, desire for a warm shower at this point. Uh, there's a desire. And I won't say that I never start with, you know, lukewarm. Yeah, but, but I always it, end ease into cold. It. Gotcha. And where, where are you going that you're going to experience some real cold? Or, or is it going to be <laughs> just out, just here. It gets cold here. Uh, there's a there's a background behind it. I mean, why are you taking cold showers? Yeah. Uh, That's kind of what I want to know. <laughs> why am I taking them? Yeah. Uh, I, there's, I've heard word of like some health benefits. Yeah. yeah, circulation and yeah, stuff. circulatory system, respiratory system, immune system. Um, I think I, there's some truth to that um, because I'm I'm a person that likes hot showers. Um, sure, and, and who doesn't? And I can, I can, yeah, I mean, but mine's like really hot, and I can tell after <laughs> I get out of a hot shower. Um, seems like an hour or two later, it just seems like I'm really cold all over, like my yes. core body temperature dropped, and I'm wondering if it's because my body reacted to all that hot water. And, yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not a doctor or a scientist, but I'm not, no, I'm not. <laughs> I just listened to the Joe Rogan podcast. And so, yeah. so I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard wind of like some benefits that come from sauning first. And so like my wife bought me a little like makeshift sauna earlier this year and I've been using it every, like every day, at least, at least every other day. And I'll go from there right to like, ideally it would be an ice bath for like, you know, inflammation and you know, all these other benefits that we talked about, but that cold shower is as close as I can get. So you're going from hot sauna to cold shower, like, yep, quick. Yeah, and I actually surprised you don't go into like shock. Well, listen, there's there's something weird with our our master um, bathroom. Yeah. Like that water will not get below like 50 degree or whatever it is, 50, 60 degree. I have it all the way on the cold setting, so I actually abandoned our master bathroom altogether. I sh I showered in our guest bathroom, and it gets colder. It gets in that ice one? cold in there, yeah. I mean, I'm yeah, sure it's have, still 40s. We don't have problem with cold water up here. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, it's it's cold up there. I have noticed as like these winter months have come up. Like in the summer, it got cold and I was like, oh, this is cold. It's probably like 55 and I don't that know. was cold. Now, as it's, as it's actually getting colder out, um, that water is cold, almost yeah. unbearable. Interesting. That's fun. I don't know. It's just a challenge. I like to suffer. <laughs> I know, but the more suffering I can like impose on myself, it seems like, you know, the easier everyday life becomes. Mm. I like that kind of thought process. Mm -hmm. That's why I did fast sometimes too. You do. Anyways, cold showers. Cold showers. It's cold in uh, Minnesota. So. Yeah, that's how it goes. So Shane, a, a couple things that you know we've we've talked to some guys. Uh, our last podcast, actually before 
um, two podcasts ago. We had John Eberhardt on, obviously a guy who's very you know rooted in that that upper Midwest, Michigan, public land, you know, saddle hunting, bow hunting type of style. You know John? Or of John? Yeah, I, know of, I, know, I know of him. I don't know him personally. Okay. Yep. And so, you know, I know kind of watching some of your videos and stuff, and we talked about it here a little bit. Um, you know, you're one who actually, unlike John, who kind of stays rooted in Michigan, you, know, you you actually will travel to hunt. And we talked about it from a turkey standpoint at first, but now it sounds more like from a deer hunting standpoint, you've kind of got that that bug to to get out there and explore different states and, and what they have to offer. Yeah, and, and that's mainly... Uh, like I mentioned before, it's because of my tracking, tracking, uh, deer for others takes a lot of my time in say October, especially November and during the rut, we're getting a ton of calls to track. And so, you know, there's plenty of days where I'm headed off to go hunting and get a call for a track and I have to abandon my hunt. So I started traveling to like these States that come in a little earlier in Nebraska, North Dakota, that sort of thing to get, you know, a jump start before deer season starts here in Minnesota and, and I start getting calls to track. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I don't think I'll ever travel like I do for Turkey, you know, for deer, um, just because, you know, Turkey, I love traveling all over the country where deer, I don't care where I'm hunting deer. I'm just basically trying to extend my season. So Nebraska, North Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin is kind of going to be where I mainly hunt for deer. Mm -hmm. And are you mainly hunting public when you go to these different States? <clears throat> Yeah, that's, that's basically all I hunt. Um, uh, I think the public lands are offering. I'm I'm not like uh, going out there to kill a big 170 or 200 inch buck. I'm just like I said, I'm just extending my season, so I'm not very picky on what I uh, harvest out there. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I go hit public land, and that's about all I hunt. The only time I ever hunt private is if locally here. I got a buddy that like I shot a buck on private this year, in Minnesota. And, and uh, a buddy's got a few acres that we can hunt. And so mm -hmm. that's about the only time I hunt it. And was that the buck with the target on its antlers? Yeah, stuck, his, stuck on his antlers. That was this year? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I, found, I Actually, I'm going to meet the guy today that the target came from. His, uh, uh, really? Buck. Yeah. We. I got a message on Facebook from a guy that has an archery shop or, or some type of outdoor shop. And he said, Shane, I think I know who, where your target came from. The guy came in here today to get trail cameras because he was describing a buck, uh, his target got destroyed by a buck and he wanted to put a trail camera in his backyard to get, you know, video of it. <laughs> if it came back through and he ended up being 1.2 miles away from Holy where I shot. Holy cow. So he, <clears throat> from the story I gathered, um, and he described the target and there was some little nuances about it that only he could know to confirm that it was his. Plus he had pictures of the target, but he went to bed on the, uh, November 9th. His target was out. I think he was shooting it that evening. He got up at 6 a.m. the next morning, I guess, to go to work or something, and his target was destroyed. And the parts were missing. He found some in the woods. And I shot that deer at, I, I can't remember, it, but it was right after daybreak, so 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. And we kind of, if you watch that video early in the in the hunt, while it's still dark, I'm getting up in the tree, you know, and I heard uh, movement. Or I heard I heard a deer grunt, and it must have heard me snapping a few lambs getting up in the tree, and it came right over there to me, and I couldn't see it in the dark. I was trying to film it with my camera with the night vision and mm. red vision, and I just got a barely of a glimpse of it, but I couldn't tell what it was. We speculated it was that buck. You know, he was just on a rampage that morning. Yeah, and we kind of <laughs> summarized that. He came from here, traveled over a mile to me that morning. I bumped him because he, he kind of got a little spooked, but he calmed down in the dark. He went around past me, I guess. And then right when it got daylight, he heard me grunting or something, and he come right back. And so um, that's kind of what our theory is on how he got to where he was. But he, he had to travel through a lot of woods and open fields and cattail marshes to get where I was and I'm surprised that target was still stuck on his antlers. Well, that's what we said. Like, I can't believe he didn't like shake it off at some point or like, you well, know, thrash a tree or something to knock it off. Yeah. yeah but, uh, I think what helps keep it on there is it wasn't just stuck in between his antlers. It was actually impaled on, on the tine. So it was in there pretty good. <laughs> yeah. That's wild, so man. Yeah. He must've rammed it and hit that target right center of the body. 
and then picked it up and sh- you know shredded all the parts apart and then just left that target stuck on his head. Buck was a straight up murderer. Out of he'd already mind. killed one buck that morning. He was looking for the next. That's crazy. And yeah, that- I mean. Was, I mean, you look at the video, he, he almost ruined the hunt when my arrow came off and I had to a, let down. He kind of spooked and yeah. he was in that, he was rut crazed. So a normal deer, like if it was September, he would have ran off. As yeah. As well it looked so like he, it, wor- it worked out for you. Like he kind of yeah. bounded off into the woods and then came back out at the perfect angle. Yeah. And that just made things, you know, I usually get rattled after the shot, you know, get the shakes and this, I started getting really nervous after i let down and and it started going south yeah (laughs) and so i was like really shaking when i had to finally make the the kill shot and did it did that arrow come just off the string or did your knock pop out no it it came off the string okay so i have uh schaefer xv instead of a drop away it it opens sideways oh gotcha and i i had put some new mole skin on it because the other one was getting wore out and i think it was too tight i gotcha and so and I may have binded it a little bit when I was drawing back. And I think what it is, the resistance and it just held that it arrow. Off. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why the arrow didn't fall to the ground. Cause that little plant, it was, was still on there. <laughs> so yeah. I'll, I'll put some thinner moleskin. I think I just put too thick of moleskin. So it was gripping the arrow too tight. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was but, wild, man. And that was that opening day of gun season. You, I know uh, you I were think, in, you were in orange. I didn't know if it was opening day. Yeah, or it, was it was. Still... So I mainly hunt Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin. I'm right near the border. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll hunt Minnesota some, but as soon as gun season comes in in Minnesota, which comes in usually a week or two earlier than Wisconsin, I'll just start focusing on Wisconsin solely. Yeah. But um, that area is a is a good area, a little travel corridor, and I'm, and and I think it was it may have been a a week into the gun season or half a week into it gotcha i can't remember what day of the week it was but um the wind was perfect for that spot my buddy was texting me said man my son hunted out there a few days or sunday so it had been a few days earlier during the middle of the week when i hunted um my son hunted out there near not far from there and he could hear a ruckus going on like some bucks fighting or, or going on he said you need to get up here and hunt this spot which it's kind of a spot i've hunted in the past and and shot does um so i was like yeah, I don't really have an idea where I wanted to hunt in Wisconsin the next morning. And I said, this will be an easy, you know, park the truck, walk 200 yards, climb up in a tree. And, and it's going to be cold that morning. I was like, it'll be an easy in and out if I get too cold and my truck's right there. Um, I was, it was kind of a lazy day hunt for me. I didn't mm. want to experience I didn't <laughs> want to go two miles back on public that morning. <laughs> yeah. So it all worked out. And when I texted him that morning, uh, my buddy, he was across the road. I said, I think I just shot the biggest buck you have on camera because they didn't have a whole lot of big bucks on camera this year and he's like i'm on my way i was like nah just sit in your tree just chill out he was across the road honey i said it's still early we might i might get a doe to come by and uh after about an hour i said heck with this i'm getting down yeah and i looked up and he was already parked next to my truck he he's already there and, ready to roll yeah. that's funny man yeah, no, that was a cool that was a cool hunt, and, and I mean, it just shows like how out of the mind like a buck can get during that time to have something. Because I mean, those those inserts on those deer aren't light either. It's not no, like no, no, I it's... don't feel it. Like I mean, there's there's some weight to that thing on top of his head. Well, it was yeah, it he... like it was heavier than five pounds at least. Yeah, yeah and he pounds. threw it like pretty soon after you shot him, which is why it was so surprising that he just left it. He just tolerated <laughs> it before. Yeah, I know. Almost and like he was. You, you see... You can see when he's coming through the cattails, he's he's almost like he's sniffing, but also almost looked like the weight of that target was a burden on him. I'm sure and it was. I, and, you know, and I, I cut this out of the video because and someone told me I should have left it in there because it was funny. But I'm hunting next to a um, a greenhouse, right? And they'll, they'll, in the fall, they'll have mums out there on these little gravel pads, and they, they'll have them in those black plastic pots yeah. that you plants in. When I saw him that morning, when I first saw him coming, I just saw some dark on his head. And I assumed he had been fighting some of those pots, you know? <laughs> yeah. He got one of those so in the video, it was like, he's got a black plastic pot stuck on his head. <laughs> and I never looked at his antlers again. After I saw that he was committed and I decided to shoot him, I was just concentrating on where his face was, his eyes were looking, you know, for my movements, yep. you know, looking at his body. And I, and that still, after he ran off and that target came off, I, I was telling my buddy, I was like, yeah, he had one of your black plastic pots on his head because he works at the greenhouse. And I said, it's laying over in the grass somewhere. And then they went over there and 
and said, no, nah, it was a target on his head. And I was That's like, crazy, wow, how did, how did I not know that? <laughs> That's nuts. Yeah, like as you're seeing, and you know, and obviously I'm reading the description and stuff, like, but then you see this buck coming in and it has to be like, you know, what the hell is on his head? Like, <laughs> that just, it's so awkward. And I think even at one point, you know, and again, just kind of reiterating some of that like tolerance those bucks will take during that time of year is like, you're pulling out uh, like a handy cam basically and filming and putting it back in your pack as he's like coming in towards you, you know? Yeah. And it's just uh, when you have that right spot, right wind and everything, and he's committed at that point, like, you know, it's going to happen. Yeah. And, and I'm surprised, <clears throat> I'm surprised that he didn't look up at me sooner or notice me in there because when I got down ground level where he had walked in and, you know, and then where he, ran away and i was looking back at the tree how skylighted i was yeah I mean, there was no back cover from his angle it was just straight sky and a, a, almost a dead tree with no leaves on it hmm. so uh, i'm surprised he didn't see me up in that tree and it wasn't like i was behind the tree in my saddle i was off to one side yep so, yeah he was just rut crazed and, and that'd get him in trouble sometimes are you um would you say you're a pri uh, primarily a saddle hunter at this point yeah, I'm, I get that question uh, a lot, especially the last uh, here in the last couple of weeks. I've been asked a few times by uh, a couple of fellas. I was one of the guys that was that was a big hang on stand. I've always liked a, a really light hang on. I've had a, I guess it's made by Lock On. Mm -hmm. It weighs about six pounds. It's about a thirty year old stand I've had for for many many years, and that's all I hunt out of basically. And my buddy Garrett Crawl. If you guys know yep. him, DIY sportsman. So he he and I hunted together and he's a saddle hunter. And and I was I was you know, I was one of those negative persons. I was like, man, there's no benefit to that saddle over my hang on. I said, there's you know, I can get in any tree you can. And uh finally one day I tried it out. And at first it was a little awkward. That's and first time I actually hunted out of a saddle. And I played with it in my yard a little bit. First time I ever hunted out of it was in Nebraska two years ago and I killed a buck that morning, you know, 30 minutes after daybreak. And I've gotten, you know, some time in the saddle and now I cannot, I cannot see myself ever going back to a hang -on. I have three or four really light hang -ons in the basement and they're just sitting there collecting dust because it's, it's so much lighter, mm -hmm. even though I have one of the lightest hang on setups out there, mm -hmm. you know, six pound stand. Um, I have the tethered one sticks that are like one pound each. Yep. Um, my over what, overall weight of my hang on setup is really light but now my my saddle setup with that little platform i think it's less than two pounds i have one of the original prototypes that gear uh, uh, gave me or sold me yep and uh, with my saddle and platform and sticks you know i'm looking at about eight pounds total uh thereabouts um and it's really compact so i can i strap it to my backpack you know and it's not even as wide as my back so i can slip through the woods real quietly I just can't see me, myself going back to a hang on at this point. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I mean, like Jared and I still, I would say that we're still primarily hang on hunters, you know, I mean, that's just kind of what we've done. It's always been a, and, and we're not afraid to, to hang and hunt. In fact, we prefer it and, and we're efficient at it. And so like, yeah. we're just picking up and, and part of it is like, there are, there are a lot of people I think that are using saddles and this is what we got in with Eberhart uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think there's a lot of people using saddles incorrectly. Um, in terms of how they're using the tree to their benefit of putting themselves, you know, that tree essentially in between them and the deer and, and being able to move around that tree and stuff. Um, you know, and that's, that's kind of been our biggest. Well, mainly we've seen guys like <clears throat> standing on a platform and like leaning way out from the tree and we've even done that. Um, you know, we had like our platform and we've hunted with some, some saddles, like some lower end saddles and stuff. And it's like, man, I feel crazy exposed. Like I don't. I couldn't figure out the benefit, like like you had said. Um, I, you know, I was just we, we've gotten really good at hanging those um, those lock on stands, and I was like, man, I just the weight is like essentially the same. <laughs> like, if I could pick up a benefit, it would be that I want to be able to like get into the tree qu quieter or faster or, mm -hmm. or or something, be be more dynamic in that sense. And I just like. Um, you know the way that we were using those saddles and the ways that i've seen them used it just it just didn't do that in fact it was an extra step it's like okay now i not only have to clip in but i still essentially have to hang a platform like yeah, I mean, you you basically have the same process you know you hang your sticks you hang your stand mm -hmm, yeah. uh, and you look into your safety harness the mm -hmm. saddle you gotta 
hang your sticks and you hang your platform and hook your safe, uh, your tether up. Yep. So it's the same process. Yes. Um, the benefit I find is like with my hang on, it is, has a bigger footprint Yep. and it makes more noise when I'm going up in the tree because I pull it up once I'm up and then I hang it Yep. where my platform is with me when I go up and I tether in and then hang my platform. So it, to me, it, it is a little quieter. I don't hit limbs and stuff. Now I did see a little bit of a segment where you're talking about the where uh, Johnny Eberhart was talking about you know people not using it properly hanging out. Yep. Um, I do hang out from my tree. I, I kind of do multiple positions. I'll stand on my platform like I hang on mm-hmm. and lean against the tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will lean out. I will kind of lower my tether so I can sit in my saddle. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a problem with deer uh, so far. Uh, I can't say that I've had a problem with deer spotting me. But I think what I do differently is I, I love smaller trees. I cannot stand hunting out of a super big tree. It feels like I'm on a, the edge of a ledge on a building. It yeah. feels like it's pushing me off. Yeah. Yeah. So I like smaller trees, you know, big around as my head, maybe. Mm-hmm. And I look for trees with, you know, multiple limbs or uh, were splits and stuff. And I yeah. like to get in those, that mix of limbs and trunks and stuff. As and a hang on, as a hang on tree stand guy, you would. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're looking for yeah. cover trees with good cover. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I do that with my saddle also. I, if you look at any of my hunts, um, uh, probably the vast majority, I'm, I'm, you know, but I basically pick what's available, but I try to pick the best that's available and still give me shots to where I want to shoot to. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's the biggest key. I mean, I'd see people using a saddle and, and they, they'll just go up a straight tree or something and, and just stick out like a sore thumb because they don't have that cover where yeah. they're at. Yeah, I've always hunted that like that. Whether I'm in the saddle or a hang on, um, I'm I'm looking for something to break up my outline. Well, I guess I've had kind of some like minor revelations, especially since we talked to John. You know, since having that opinion that I just shared with you, um, the biggest of which I think is probably <clears throat> the saddle does have a, a much. It's more compact. Yeah, and so while the, the weight of the tree stand never bothered me, the fact that I had it over top of a bag, over top of a bow in my other hand, over top of, you know, whatever else rat- rattling antlers is going on. It's just, it's just like, it's bulky, you know, mm-hmm. even the lighter and then, ones. And then if you're slipping through thick cover, exactly. a lot of the stuff I hunt, the cattail marshal stuff, you know, a lot of the woods, and there's a lot of, what they have buckthorn up here in basis, yep. um, tree species and, and other high stem count stuff grown in the woods with a big stand, hang on stand. You know, all you hear is pink, pink, pink. Yeah, blue, just hitting blue, off blue. of it. Yeah. 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 Where my platform, my platform, actually, I will put it inside my backpack sometimes to uh, just keep it from hitting stuff, especially in the early season when I don't have to carry much in my backpack, like extra layers of clothes or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And so it makes it much easier than that. I wanted to ask you guys <clears throat> about when John uh, Eberhart was talking about how people use it wrong. Did I didn't see, I didn't watch the entire video, so I'll admit to that. Did he explain how he does it? Does he like stand against the tree in his saddle yeah. or what does he do differently? He, yeah. he basically, um, he's not opposed to using a platform, right? But his, his so main, the ring of steps, his yeah. main, that was the yeah, main was ring of steps. Pushing. And he always is positioning that tree between him and where he thinks the deer are coming from. And then with the ring of steps, being able to reposition if they come from a different direction, essentially, well, you, I guess. you know, it, the, must, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I was, I was going to say the one thing, too, about John that is different than most any other person we've talked to, and we've seen his scent-controlled Bible, basically, that he created, is, like, he doesn't care about the wind, right? He doesn't he doesn't hunt the wind at all. Yeah. Well, well here is... Um, my, my situation, um, I guess it's based on where I hunt or the locations I choose, um, and I, I'm changing my strategies these days a little bit to, to, to hunt more focused on buck bedding, but... I've always been just a general deer hunter. I look for as many trails intersecting those hubs so that I can see deer. I like, I enjoy seeing deer, whether I'm going to shoot one or not. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I'm set up, deer can come from any direction. And so to have the ring of steps to me, positioning the tree ahead of time where I think deer are going to come from doesn't do me any good because and come deer just anyway. come from any, yeah, they come from my left behind me, my right in front of me. Well, and so I just, I'd, I'd look for that tree cover is what I focus on. That, that was a game changer for us. Cause I think you and I were thinking about saddle. 
first of all, we just we just didn't have the right saddle, uh, you know, so we didn't have the right experience because mm -hmm. we so you know that had us in the tree like on a platform, you know, leaning out away from the thing, like you know, frankly, not that comfortable and not that much better of a process than mm -hmm. uh, the lock on. So, so talking to John kind of revealed that you know. Yes, not only are we like reducing the imprint of that stand so you can get there, you know, quietly. I do see that benefit. Um, but in the tree, you know, his biggest thing is like it, it's fine if you have that that platform. You know, it's not a bad thing, but you have to have that ring, ring of steps. And instead of like, <clears throat> you know, standing on that platform and leaning away from the tree, like you see, you know, most most guys do, and frankly, on you know, social and YouTube and stuff, uh, the way he's treating it is 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 like a seat. Like he's sitting in. And the, the main difference is so you've got like a single panel saddle and, and a double panel saddle, which, we, you know, we didn't know until a couple of days ago when we talked to him. And so a single panel, it's like you, you have to lean out away from it. Otherwise, that thing is going to ride up, you know, and, and even yeah. still, it still kind of does that. And so with a double panel saddle, the way we, we we went and picked some up, we picked up some John and Eberhart, you know, signature series tethered saddles after talking to him just because it's like, well. We have to yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> that gives us the ability now to to really sit in that thing comfortably and have like kind of legs bent. And by having that that ring of steps around the tree, it's not like your knees are up against. You're trying to get on this thing on the front. You're essentially like straddling straddling the tree, and you could just kind of like w work around it. And so it seems much more comfortable. And I, I can now see the utility of like how that would be, you know, maybe better than a, a stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that makes sense where he's talking about where you sit in the and it's, it is i sit like that a lot of times i'll i'll spread my legs and have the you know come down and have the tree right in front of me exactly yeah and um it's not totally comfortable a lot of times because my legs are back behind me on the platform i can see where you if you had the ring steps you could use those, right. um a yeah, leverage. he's almost extending his feet out on the other rings of steps type of yeah. thing they're just yeah, more like they're just more like balance points. Like his feet would be exactly. at that point, just kind of, and he's just shimmying around the tree. Exactly. Yeah, it's pretty and, cool. Um, yeah, I, I sit in my saddle a lot of times. Um, I'll 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 loosen it up a little bit and slide it under my my butt a little bit so that I'm more sitting on it than yeah than um, kind of leaning back from it. And, and like I said earlier, I I switch positions like every thirty minutes or so. Like I'll lean back in it for thirty minutes. I may sit in it for 30 minutes. Sure. Um, I may stand on my platform for 30 minutes, whatever I, you know, just kind of, and I do the same thing in my hang on. I was going to say, yeah, no different than your lock on of putting the seat up, leaning against the tree, putting the seat down, sitting down, putting the yeah. seat up and just standing and turning around. And sit down I, I will admit, the tree. I, I, I will admit, I tend to move more in my saddle mm -hmm. um, than I do in my, you know, in my hang on. I'll sit like I'm just sitting right now talking to you guys. Whereas in my, in my uh, saddle, I'm constantly kind of just, you know, it's kind of, um, <laughs> what's, what's the word to describe it? You, you really don't realize you're doing it. You just, yeah, you're just, just like, you're, you're, a, you're fidgeting basically. Yeah. Like, you know, if you were sitting in a swing set on a playground. You're going to, yeah. you wouldn't just sit idle. You're going to kick yeah. off with your too much, too much around. fun. You're like, oh, it's fun <laughs> to move yeah. around here. But a lot of the reason I move is because I'm constantly looking around behind me and mm -hmm. I, I may lean out of the tree to look around it. And I, I usually have a smaller tree that I hunt out of, like I said, so I don't have to move too much. But I find myself kind of using that pendulum motion of the saddle to look around easier. Yeah. Um, I don't know how, how many deer bust me yet. I haven't, to, to my recollection, I don't recall any. But there's probably deer that have seen me and slipped out of there without my knowledge. So I'm mm. sure it's you know it's possible it's happened. Yeah. And and I guess kind of shame based on what you're talking about with your setups, like <laughs> you you definitely seem like you're trying to get uh, you know, more aggressive and get like real close to that buck butting area. I mean, you're in some you're in some thick stuff. Yeah, and and I'm that's kind of what I've been concentrating on the last couple of years. I haven't dove like hardcore into it like my buddy garrett he and i hunt uh quite a bit together in the early season mm -hmm. and he goes all in you know he's looking at like he's skipping a day to hunt this one particular area where we were in nebraska because the wind wasn't right so he's gonna hang back and observe and i'm more of the approach of you know i just want to kill a deer uh i'm i'm going in whether or not i think the wind's <laughs> right or not you know? yeah um so i'm i still don't have that commitment yet but I am focusing on some of that where I hunt and I do see some bucks get out of the bed. They're, they're usually smaller ones, you know, spikes or little four pointers or something. Um, I think with 
some more time and experience. And like I told you earlier before the podcast, the deer bug really got me this year. Um, there's a spot that I found that I think I could really focus on and find out exactly where they're bedding. And then next fall, dive in there in the early season and maybe you know, get one of those bucks come out of the bed in the early season. So um, we're going to see how that goes. But uh, right now, I'm not I'm not the one to be asking about um, uh, tactics to, for targeting big bucks in the buck bedding. I'm still learning, basically. Roger. Yeah, I so I, I think kind of where I'd like to pivot on that side is, is to kind of dive into this trailing thing. And, and really, you know, I, I say this because, uh, Shane, like, I don't, I mean, I know there's a bunch of different trackers out there. I don't know if I've ever really been able to talk to anyone who has probably experienced as many trails to that lead to essentially a, a recovered animal to say, Oh, this deer was shot in the liver. Or this deer was shot in the guts or whatever, you know, artery. And so I guess where I'm really curious is, um, you know, uh, kind of to pick your brain a little bit on some of the things that you're seeing happening from shot impact throughout the trail to, to recovery. And I think it really kind of resonates with what you had started this conversation uh, talking about Cali and saying that you are scent tracking more than blood trailing um, yes. in that in that aspect of things. And and I say that because I think the one thing that's still, whether you're blood trailing or you're scent tracking that comes back is the behavior of that deer post shot. You know, what did that deer do from the moment it was shot to the time that hopefully you recover it? Um, and, and maybe we use, uh, an example. Um, I know one of the most recent ones you, you kind of published out there was talking about this, this 33 hour, uh, track job basically. And, and I guess just to enlighten some of our listeners on this, kind of give us the background of like, you know, the tracking process from like, you know, somebody reaches out to you, like what's the next step type of thing? So, yeah, if someone calls me, you know, obviously I got to find out where they're located. If it's even within my uh, uh, service area. Um, the next thing I want to know is when they shot the deer, where they think they hit the deer, uh, what did the arrow look and smell like? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm asking all the questions I can to try to determine where this deer was lightly hit and if it was a fatal shot or not and our likelihood of recovering it. Now, I, I don't necessarily turn down tracks because if I think the deer's still alive, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm available and, and, um, and it's, you know, in, in my service area, I'll still run it just to put their mind at ease that the deer's not fatally wounded. And um, a lot of times we're pretty good at getting that right. You know, um, a lot of these tracks I went on this past fall, um, I, I think about 75 or 80 percent of them had already shown up on trail camera or were shot later in the season. So we were right in our assessment that those deer were not fatally hit. Gotcha. Um, one, yeah. Um, so um, and one deer, I was actually called to track again after it was shot a second time. I wasn't able to <laughs> But my buddy, uh, my buddy went and found the deer, and, and it had the wound from the arrow hit. It was shot with a gun later in the season. Wow! But so yeah, I'm I'm trying to get to determine where I think the, the deer was hit, and that helps me determine not only if it was a lethal hit, but how long should I wait before I track? Mm -hmm. Because wherever the deer was hit, it's going to uh, affect how long it lives after the shot. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of it's uh, kind of a guess, you know, from our experiences, our, our best guess, like a liver shot, uh, we usually like to give them six to eight hours minimum. I know some guys will give it overnight. Um, I've seen liver shots kill deer within minutes, you know, depending on where it hits the liver, mm -hmm. you know, how big of a broadhead, if you're shooting a big expandable versus a smaller fix. Um I've actually shot a deer in, in the liver and, and it ran, you know, a, a short distance and then bedded down and I watched it, you know, die expire within 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. But then I've tracked deer that were hitting the liver, square in the liver. And I always stick around for the, um, uh, it's not an autopsy, a ne necropsy or whatever they call it for yeah. animals. Yeah. Your gut um, job. Field, field dressing. <laughs> yeah. for, the, for the gut job. Yeah. So, um, and I, I take pictures inspect the organs and, and take pictures and, and it helps me, but also helps, uh, you know, others, you know, seeing what shots deer take and how long they live. But anyway, I've tracked deer that were liver shot. Um, and we're still alive 16 hours later. So there's, mm. there's a, a window that I like, but you know, anything can happen. They could be dead earlier or dead or still alive or later. 
Um, so once I determine where it was shot and the likelihood of it, you know, if it's still alive or expired, then I set a or uh, try to arrange a time to track it with the hunter. And then we proceed to the, the location when the time is appropriate. Uh, once I get there, uh, if there's other clues I can look at before running my dog on it, I will. You know, the color of the blood. I like darker blood. Um, a, a lot of people get excited when they find blood after they shoot a deer. It's like, oh, it's bright red blood. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that could be leg blood, you know, muscle blood. Because um, the brighter the blood, the more oxygen in the blood. Mm -hmm. Darker the blood, the less oxygen. So on a darker blood, you're usually getting into liver, uh, gut area, you know, stuff that typically has darker blood. But as blood leaves, you know, when blood goes to the lungs and it's enriched with oxygen, it turns bright red. And then it travels to all the extremities, the legs, the other organs, you know, the brain. And it's bright red. So if you cut a vessel in that that's heading away from the lungs, it's going to be bright red. Mm hmm. Once the, that oxygen is expended by the brain or the muscles and it returns to the heart to be pumped back to the lungs, it's going to be dark. So you can hit a leg shot and it'd be dark blood or you can have a leg shot that's bright red. So, um, and, but it's usually not as dark as liver or gut region. Mm -hmm. But if you, but my point is if you get bright red blood, it could be from anywhere on the body. It could be a heart shot. It could be a leg shot, brisket shot. So um, a lot of guys get excited about that, but as a tracker, I like darker blood, even if it started out bright initially mm -hmm. and it starts getting darker, that means maybe the deer's lungs aren't working, or at least one of them's not working. He's mm -hmm. running, you know, he's burning up oxygen out of his whole system. Now the blood's getting darker and darker. It's just like, um, uh, people that may have, um, <clears throat> like I'll, I'll use my dad, for example, he had, a uh, um, emphysema and, and some uh, type of lung cancer from uh, as asbestos. Yeah. And so he a lot of times had to use oxygen and his lips would turn purple when his whole body's oxygen levels get low. So you're, you're going to see that uh, occur in, in deer also as their total blood level uh, oxygen level in their body starts to deplete. Same and that's same. a good sign. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Are you um, this isn't to like put you on the spot and target anyone, but but out of curiosity, I guess two questions. Number one is do you tend to get more calls from vertical bow hunters or crossbow hunters? And then I guess in turn with that, are you seeing any trends in types of broadheads that you end up trailing deer for more than others? So, um, initially it used to be, uh, compounds mostly because, um, you can't use crossbows during archery season in Minnesota. Gotcha. Um, you you could in I can't Still? remember when they legalized it in Wisconsin, but uh, at some point they legalized it in Wisconsin where anybody could just buy a crossbow. Uh, yeah, three dollars you can get and 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 I've seen a this past year I've seen an uptick and it's about even crossbow versus uh, compound. Gotcha. I'd say the compound still lead a little bit, but I think most people are using a compound versus a a, a crossbow. Mm -hmm. As far as broadheads goes, it used to be vastly more for mechanicals. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of people say, well, the mechanicals, they, there's a lot more people using it. Now, we did a, a, a bunch of polls or polls on a bunch of different Facebook pages. Yep. With some on southern hunting groups and some on northern hunting groups, midwestern hunting groups. And they always came out to the same result, 51-49 or 50 50 or 51 49 the other way yep we actually had a, a fella dispute that and i said well create you a poll on any page you want and we'll see what the results are and it came back the same exact it same. was always 50 50 and so i said yeah it seems like the consensus or just based on the polls that you know about 50 percent of people are using fix and 50 percent are using mechanicals depending on who you ask um so i so that kind of uh, eliminated the thing of people saying, yeah, there's, there's a lot more mechanical right. sold. That's why you're seeing that now in the last, uh, at least this season and maybe some of last season, it seems to be about half and half. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, um, maybe there's a, you know, the trend with the heavy arrow fixed, you know, the ranch ferry type of thing. There's a yes. lot of people I think switch. So there's possibly more people going back to fix and, and whatnot so I, I don't have enough data or any you know proof to you know to assert that as as fact but hmm. just from my tracking stats it seems about half and half 
I would um, say, a, little I would, bit more, a little bit more towards fix this past year. I would say to complement that, I think that um, expandables have probably uh, been improved mm-hmm. on uh, quite a bit more than, fix. it, you know, fixed blades have seen improvements as well, like let's say over the past 10 years, mm-hmm. but, but not nearly as much as mechanicals have. Mm-hmm. And there's only so much you can do with a fix. It's a solid, you know, solid broadhead where a mechanical, right. you, you could beef up the blades and yeah. yep. toughen them up. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Bigger diameter. I Dude, mean, there, there is a, like Shane was saying, though, there is a, whether it's the ranch ferry or like these, uh, the FOC guys or grizzly stick guys, there's a school of thought. There, like, there's people out there, you know, frankly, that I, some of which I'd love to have on the podcast, but they are all about momentum. Like it's all, mm-hmm. that's the only thing that matters. And uh, like I jumped, I just for a, a brief moment, I jumped on that train. I was like, "Oh, what's this about?" And yeah. uh, it was enough for us to like increase our total arrow weight, um, to to, to dive into like trying to understand FOC well, we, and stuff. I was gonna say we think about FOC when but, we do our builds. Oh, hundred percent. That's what I build my arrows for, yeah. and and your arrows yeah. for uh, momentum for yeah. for penetration. <laughs> and but where we got off that train is, um, at some point you have to cut the thing. You have to put yeah. a big hole in it. And I'm not somebody who doesn't like to have blood, mm-hmm. um, you know, because if that, if that deer runs out of sight um, and I don't have a, a good blood trail, you know, likely because I've used a, a, a fixed blade, blade broadhead, which I have plenty of times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not a situation that, that you want. So so where Jeremy and I are at with that is we, we build our arrows for for penetration. And uh, like I'm shooting an 80, 80 pound Hoyt carbon spider with a 470 grain, you know, total setup, most of which is up front. But. You and I are both shooting them rage tripans, mm-hmm. like at, at the tip. And there's some other, you know, solid mechanical sure. broadheads. All it has to be is is durable. It cannot break or or bend, um, and it has to be, you know, sharp. And ideally, we like a. I want a I want a big entry hole, not conservative, but not over the top either. Like a you know two and three quarter inch mm-hmm. cutting diameter is like, so that that gives us all the penetration. I I mean I blew through that deer I shot this year, quartering to me like right through his front shoulder. Um, you know, and I had a giant hole in them cause I'm using a, mm-hmm. you know, and I've got that forgiveness of if I hit them in the guts or in the liver, well, that's where we, I don't want to fix blade if I, if that happens. That was the marginal piece that I think we went to Shane is that we looked at it from a, from a pure entry hole cut diameter. We're give me blood. Ram cats for a long time. Yeah. And I, and I love Ram cats still. Yeah. I th- it's a great broadhead. One of the best fixed blade broadheads. Yep. Yeah, I, but I, if I made a marginal shot, if it was anything back of the lungs, like it was tough to find blood. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm just based off my tracking experience and my hunting experience. I want pass throughs. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. just my tracking stats, I posted them at one point. I used to have the Cali Chronicles Facebook page, but now that's all been consolidated <laughs> on one, my Shane Simpson hunting Facebook page. Yep. But I posted a, a lot of stats um, on deer that we tracked that had a pass through. And whether the intestines clogged the hole or whatever reason they lost, they needed a dog out there, we recovered something like sixty something, sixty something odd percent of um, those tracks. Mm-hmm. On tracks we went on where there was no pass through, we only recovered like twenty seven percent of them. Wow. Yep. And 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 that you know I've always wanted to pass through because it gives you an exit hole. One hundred percent. And and I've always been a fixed guy. Now I did try mechanicals at one point. And I shot four deer with them. One was, uh, I think two were with a rage and two were with a, and I can't remember off the top of my head. It, they opened from the front. They're not squackers. They were something else. Um, like an Exodus or something. I, no, this they, a grave they, digger. They What's that? Grave digger. Or I don't think so. Grave um, I can't remember. Grim, Grim Reaper was it, Grim Reaper. No, it wasn't one of those. It was, uh, I can't, I, I'll let you know later okay. <laughs> when I, Dig it up. But the point of my story is out of those four deer I shot with a mechanical, two two rear deploying, two forward re- deploying, I did not have a pass through on any of them. Yeah. And all my years of deer hunting was fixed. I mean, from the time I was 13 or whatever, 14 bow hunting, there was only one deer that I can recall that I didn't get a pass through with a fixed blade. Yep. And had I not saw those deer, you know, they ran out to a cattail marsh or whatever. And I lost sight of them, you know, behind a bush. I was able to find them because I, where I last saw them, that's where I found them laying dead. All four shots killed the deer. Yeah. But I did not have a blood trail on any of them. Yeah. You know, maybe a couple of specks, but there was nothing on the cattails. And I walked the exact path the deer took. And so that's what steered me away from it. And mm-hmm. it wasn't like I 
had a bad tuned bow. I was, I, mean, I was shooting fixed. I was shooting yeah. tight groups. Um, so that's kind of got me leery of shooting mechanicals ever again. Yep. Now, with that said, if they make improvements on them, and I know I listened to a podcast that featured the guy from Rage at one point. Um, he talked about how they would love to make their broadheads heavier and beefier, but the public doesn't want it and they won't buy it. Yeah. They and don't so make that tri pin in a 125. Yeah, it's 100 as, grains. As evidence of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, but if I was to pick one today to shoot a mechanical, um, I think I would pick the Sever. That seems to have the. We've heard a lot of good stuff about that. I've shot them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Based on what I've tracked. And the ones I've tracked, you know, I keep track of every broadhead I track for, uh, you know, the, the mm-hmm. brand and the model. Um, the Severs, even though we've been called on a few of those tracks and we've been called to track for a bunch of Rage and, and Exodus, Q, QAD Exodus broadheads, you name it, we've cut track for them all. Yeah. Those Severs just seem to, we always get pass through. It's always pass through tracks. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's never like halfway in. They just seem to bust through bone and go through there. And when Sever first came out, they had those pivoting blades. I, I was a little yep. leery of that, but they seem to be yeah. doing a good job. And they they look when you look at one in person, they are they are they look to be built well. Yeah, they, they look well. mean. They are. <clears throat> I guess like first of all, I just want to you know point out that like n- none of these like I- issues that we're we're pointing out here are solely tied to like the, the broad. Like sure, n- none of us here are here saying like well the. If you shoot a broadhead, th- this will happen. If you shoot a mechanical, this will happen. It it's, has a lot to do with the archer, the situation, the bow and stuff. Yeah. It, but we've had a lot of the same uh, experiences that, that you have had, had Shane. And uh, I, so I, I started shooting those um, severs uh, because I was in that. Uh, I was kind of going down that. Um, I, I had grown out of shooting the the fixed blades i was like man i need i need a blood trail i need a hole yeah. so i started looking at mechanicals and so like you know rage is obviously the most you part. shot swaggers well, no. at one point which... well okay <laughs> i could talk about that too basically i feel like there's like fixed blades there's mechanicals and then there's like schwacker which to me is like the the bottom i think that's the worst case scenario let me start with the sever first yeah the, the i think the sever is probably the most well-built mechanical broadhead I've ever seen or, or right. shot. I think they're fantastic. I agree. That's what I'll say. When you see one in person, you can, it looks yep. well-built. Yep. My uncle put me onto those, and he's like, oh, these are great. I agree. I think they're sick. The The only reason I don't shoot them and the only issues that I've had with them is um, they don't work with my single point of contact quiver. Um, so, like, like, I'm shooting that Hoyt, the mm-hmm. RX-5, and you can, there's only one quiver that works with that bow. And, Which is a Hoyt. And Hoyt makes it. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, you know, stick the head of, you know, in the, you know, foam pocket. And there's a single point of contact. And those severs have just a little rubber band on them or a little band. And if it gets any pressure at all, like That's from that it. foam head, it, yeah, it's, um, it, it can mess with it. And so I couldn't shoot them. Yeah, like so, it, so you would need a, um, a quiver with just a hood, but two yeah, points of contact. Exactly. That's right, because it needs to be free floating. It can't have pressure against that head, otherwise it gets mm-hmm. messed with. Well, and rage I mean, will work well, in those, but even still, I mean, you put too much pressure in, and it'll bust that collar open. Yes. Yeah, so, so I would put those guys in the in the same. I would even put sever slightly a, ahead of it. I think it's a better built broadhead. It just doesn't work with my quiver, so I'm. <laughs> Which is crazy when you think about it. Like that's the that's the stop point. So on it. yeah, so yes, I agree. I think those are two yeah. great bro- mechanical broadheads to look at. Would be the Sever and the the Rage Tripan. I think there's a lot of fixed blades out here that you know that are really solid. Why I hate that Schwacker so much is like you. The more holes in that deer, the more likely he is to die, and the more you know blood he's going to shed as you're you know you're trailing him and stuff. And those yeah. Schwackers. If you don't get an exit hole, which is already less likely than an entry hole, you don't have a hole. It's like a it's like a a pin because yeah, your entry hole is small to begin with. It's a field. There point. isn't one. Yeah, it's a field point hole. It's a field point hole. And then once it gets in there, like their selling point or how they market that is that you have fresh blades on the organs, which you know, great. That is cool. But if you don't have the exit wound after that, which is already less likely than the entry, then there is no blood and there's no blood trail. And there's a lot of momentum loss for when those blades hit and then have to open. I mean, there's a lot of friction stopping that, that arrow. Well, and see, that's where I was talking about, you know, the nuance here of like, it's not just the broadhead. Like I've, since I've been shooting these 80 pound bows and I've, Mm -hmm. I've 
uh, increase the weight of my arrows. I've never not gotten a pass through with a mechanical broadhead, yeah. e- even though I, I acknowledge I that a lot of shame. people say that and, and they like, man, I don't know what the problem is, but I never get, you know, I never have a problem getting pass throughs, mm. but with the mechanical or rage, or whatever. And you see that argument a lot, but what I tell folks is I, I don't even, you know, don't include your, or don't use your own experience. You should, but, at the same time, you got to look at the general public when you're oh, making 100. When you're making a claim about what is the best broadhead or what is the best broadhead for a certain application, it's not necessarily it's the best. But if you were restricting the public to only buy one broadhead, yep, you got to look at what's best for the general public without them doing any research for themselves, right? Yep. So overall, it seems like a lot of people don't either have the the draw weight or the draw length or a tuned bow and mm-hmm. that's why they're not getting past well, the, and those are the feet. things yeah that that's yeah. what should make I, that decision for you i'm not at all in fact i would say somebody shooting like a 60 65 pound bow i wouldn't necessarily recommend a mechanical oh, I, I see i think i think the biggest flaw in this and this is the industry conversation right that needs to be had out there the biggest flaw isn't in the bow or broadhead it's in the arrow right for the longest time we were told lighter is better lighter is faster right that's where carbon came from well, if you go and pick up a Here's seven your maxima three fifty blues, yeah, if you go get a seven point three grain per inch arrow and you put a hundred grain rage whatever doesn't matter broadhead on it and you shoot it, you probably won't get a pass through because there's not enough forward momentum to drive that thing through. I don't care if you're shooting a seventy pound bow; it's because and, your arrow's not built right with that FOC to carry that momentum forward. And then, and then if you have a a flimsy arrow yeah your spines and everything and that's where the flaw is it's it i think the flaw is in the is in the arrow but yeah the broadheads and the the bows i mean it doesn't matter if we go pick up a hundred grain muzzy or you pick up a a big single bevel you know broadhead like you can kill a deer with that thing but if your arrow setup is incorrect the amount of pass-throughs and even accuracy of that shot is going to be widely varied now now with with saying that, you know, I think back on my four kills with the mechanicals, even though I didn't get passes on any of them. That was back in the time where I shot really light arrows. Mm-hmm. And um, we all did. And so maybe that was the, the key. Now I'm shooting a 560 grain arrow, 73 pounds, a 30 inch draw. You drive that um, thing right through. It'd be very possible. And, you know, I've thought about experimenting with experimenting with a severed if i was going to use a mechanical that's what i said i would use yep on my next uh you know next season experiment with shooting those and as soon as i shoot one and don't have passes then i'm i'm done with them but yeah um i bet you would though i mean with what you just said in terms of your setup you know and again we all got caught up and it's no knock to them and i know there's people still shooting them but we all got caught up once the light arrow thing wasn't cool it was like oh let's go shoot full metal jackets Right. Those are the, it's a heavy arrow. That's the build. Which, and to Easton's credit, I mean, I, I think, I don't want to give too much credit because back in the day, everybody shot super heavy arrows, but then they went super light. And then Easton brought that full metal jacket back. Mm-hmm. And Midwest Whitetail was like where we saw it, anyways. Yeah. You know, they got some people to pick up steam there. And that was like the first time people were like, oh, like heavy arrows. You know, this is interesting. But, but I don't even think those full metal jackets were, very effective because they were just heavy all the way all out. the way through yeah you'd be way better yeah. off having a stiff you know lean not that heavy shaft with that can support you know more weight towards the front yeah. which is what gives you your momentum yeah so so like well i am because i'm shooting that 80 pound bow but i've got uh, v- victory vap mm-hmm. victory vap is it it's a micro diameter arrow it's yeah. a, super stiff it's 250 uh, it's a two right. two fifty spine, so it's really stiff. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, that's what I'm shooting. Yeah, it only weighs like seven point nine grains per inch, but I've got a big FX archery, you know, outsort towards the end of it. And so my total weight is like four hundred and seventy grains. With most of that towards the front. With most of it towards the front. And I'm shooting that thing at like uh three hundred, right? Just below three hundred? Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying is I and I think to your point, Shane, and and I'm sure you you've got way more knowledge in this side than we do. Is I bet a lot of the guys who are shooting mechanicals and stuff, and even some fixed blades that aren't getting pass throughs, probably are just shooting super light arrows, and there's no thought of FOC and weight forward and and that on the bow anymore. You know, and that's an yeah. arrow build. Yeah, and uh, talking about speed, you guys are probably too young 
uh, to remember back when they used to have overdraws on a bow. Oh, you I remember, remember that. that. Yeah. Okay. Um, that I bought a <laughs> Bear Jennings Carbon Extreme many, many, many years ago, and um, I wanted it as light as fast as the arrow coming out of things I could get. Um, back then, three hundred feet per second was the yeah. mythical number, the magic number. Bows were just starting to hit that. Well, we were coming out of the the double X seventy five aluminum days at that yeah, point. Yeah, you know? I was shooting those twenty one seventeen and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. And so I put an overdraw on my on my bow. I have I think my I had still had a thirty inch draw. I think my arrows were like twenty four inches long or something ridiculously <laughs> short. Because, you know, an overdraw for anyone that's never seen one. Um, you know, basically it reset. The recess is your rest all the way back to next to the string, uh, depending on how long of an overdraw you had. I had speed knocks on my strings. You know, there was no <laughs> silencers. There was nothing. And I went to the bow shop and used their chrono and and got 320 or 319 feet per second. And that guy looked at me. He said, holy smokes, what are you what are you shooting? You know, he couldn't believe at that time when 300 was hard to get. Yeah, I was shooting 319. But you're talking about a really loud bow. I mean, it sounded like a crossbow going off. And <laughs> it's a wonder it didn't blow up in my hands. I was, I don't even know if I was shooting what the, uh, the amount of weight that should have even been considered safe for that. bow. <laughs> what but, do you mean? I can't shoot these 400 spine arrows out of this 80 pound yeah, bow. Exactly. Um, and now I'm shooting, uh, you know, back then it was probably 350 grains or le less than that. I don't even remember what they were. Yeah. But now I'm shooting something 560 grains. I was last year, I was shooting um, 660 grains. I dropped 100 off of it. Um, yeah. I lightened it up a little bit because I wanted some um, more speed. Yeah. Well, I'd, um, I I could shoot out to about 40 yards, but then it just really t uh, dropped off. Yeah. Um, although I've never, I don't think I've ever shot a deer past 40. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't like the fact that I couldn't shoot at 50 reliably with them. So I knocked a hundred off of now. I still feel good about the way of the arrow. Um, my bow is so much more quieter than I was shooting 420 grains for the last 10 years or whatever. Um, even with that extra 140 grains, my bow is super quiet. I was at the archery shop. Um, when was it, uh, back in the summer and shooting an arrow a few times, my bow a few times. And one of the guys that just happened to be in there, one of the customers, he said, man, that bow is super quiet. And, um, mm. I, I think that's, uh, um, a lot of times, you know, that's what I don't have an issue with deer ducking my arrows, you know, like, like you see a lot of people yeah. go back and watch my Nebraska hunt where I shot that doe. Um, and I can't remember if I had slow-mo on that video or not, but if you go back and watch it, I stopped that doe. I was like, man, man, you know, get her to stop. And I, I always aim for the bottom third. So in case they drop, I still hit double long, yep. but I'm aiming for the heart basically. She did not even flinch. I shot and that, that deer stood there. And that happened twice this year where deer just stood there and let the arrow hit them or go, you know, yeah, or, or without any reaction. And I think a lot of that trip is attributed to, I'm shooting a little he slightly heavier air than I have in the past. Yeah. I think and that's a that big Matthews, piece. That Matthews Creed I shoot is um, super, uh, you know, quiet to begin with. Yeah. And that just makes it even more quieter. So it I, sounds like a little whisper. I've heard that argument of, you know, I've gone down that rabbit trail of talking to some guys about FOC and stuff. And they're like, well, speed is irrelevant. Like if you're shooting a heavy enough arrow, like it'll be totally silent. And it is within some, 30 yards. I think there's some validity to that, but I, I'm in the same boat as you Shane, where I went heavier. I think I was up to five sixty or something like that. And I was like, I was like, I've got more than enough weight and momentum on this thing. I was like, I need, yep. I need some more speed, especially for, you know, I wanted to take that same bow out and do a mule deer hunt. And that's what I was going to say in the Dakotas and stuff. Like people might hear us say, well, like you want to shoot 50, like that's far. Well, in the Dakotas, that's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> like, 70, 70, 80, you know, 90 yards. You should be at least practicing out to, if not prepared to shoot out to 60, 70 yards. And, um, yeah, it's tough to do that with, with that heavy of an arrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a lot of people say is that, is that happy ground is that happy medium, you know, where yeah. I, I was, I thought I went a little too heavy. I was, I really wasn't counting grains when I was making my arrow build. I bought you know, some serious Vulcan 250s. Mm -hmm. I got a 200 grain um, broadhead. I had a 100 grain insert. I was trying to get the FOC. And then when I put it all on the scale, I was like, holy cow, that's a 
a heavy arrow. <laughs> Water <Yeah>. buffalo arrow. <laughs> yeah. So I shot it for a season. And I didn't have any issues with it per se. It's just I could notice out past 40, it really you know, dropped off. So I was like, let me back it down a little bit. Dropping it back just 100 grains. And it just seemed like, you know, my, uh, you know, the arc in my arrow mm -hmm. uh, flattened uh, drastically. And so yeah. I'm happy right now with 560 um, and my speed and my, you know, my draw weight and everything seems to be, I'm happy with what I got right now. Awesome. I, I think a lot of people also miss out the fact that the, the more, ba more FOC balance that you're looking at and that weight forward and things like that, the smoother that flight of arrow is too, um, you know, and, and when you're target shooting, especially like, you know, I remember the days when I was shooting super fast and I'm like, man, you know, did that fish tail, did it kick this way? Did it do that? When you've got that heavy, heavy build arrow with that forward momentum, like you tend to see that real smooth flight pattern and that's what you want. I mean, when you shoot that arrow, you don't want to see it kick in either which way or hitting, you know, that, that target just a little bit on an angle. I mean, it should be super smooth and straight everywhere. I think that's uh, happened to me with adding uh, some weight to my arrows and some FOC. I don't know how much the FOC affected it, but when I'm shooting, just practicing at my target, um, I do have consistently better groups. Yep. And I I rarely have those flyers where when I'm shooting uh, a really light or a lighter arrow, and and I don't know if it's the shock of the release or whatever. But, you know, I would have good groups. I wouldn't hunt with the bow if I didn't have good groups. But every once in a while, I'd have that flyer that was off four or five inches. And I'm mm -hmm. like, what in the world happened there? But I, it seems to be now that I'm more consistent in my, yep. my groupings and my shooting. It's the FOC so, that's doing that. Correct. <clears throat> it's it's not just necessarily the weight. It's it's just like a um those Nerf footballs mm -hmm. that have yeah. the tails on them and stuff. Like, if you throw a regular football, like, it's got a tendency to wobble. You know, but the yeah. Nerf footballs have all their weight is up front. And it just has a, you know, dead trajectory of feathers yeah. behind it, essentially. And it always levels out perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting. And, and and again, like, you know, as we start talking about the industry and we get into the, the blood trailing here in a second. But like, it's one of the things like I think we there's always debate on the broadhead side, like fixed blade, expandables, etc. But if you don't switch that arrow up correctly, you know, from from the get go. I mean, you're you're putting yourself as a, at a disadvantage no matter what you use. You know, it doesn't doesn't matter. Yeah, I, th I think that's the key is, uh, and I see that with crossbows more so because they seem to well compounds used to do this a lot. They come as a pre set up kit, hundred percent arrows and everything. And um, I went to one sporting goods store and they had some crossbows out there, and I've never uh, hunted with a crossbow or never owned a crossbow. And so I was looking at the crossbows, just, you know, checking them out. And they had, you know, the whole kit and caboodle there, arrows yep. with broadheads, yep. you know, everything. And I was like, man, I can see what the problem is here. People it's it. that don't really have a hunting background want to get into it. They go buy this kit, shoot at the, the target a few times and call it good yep. without properly, you know, making sure everything's flying great. And well, the yeah. biggest issue I see with those, this is a little sidebar is when they buy those kits they don't have lighted knocks on those crossbow yep. bolts and i wish all hunters would shoot a, a lighted knock because um it's amazing how many tracks i go on and i asked <clears throat> excuse me the hunter where they hit the deer well i think it was a good hit i'm like you didn't see the arrow no it's flying too fast i'm shooting a crossbow you know it's 400 pound draw um why don't you have a lighted knock well you know it came with it didn't come with yeah. one you know um so I wish, and, and the guys, and I've been keeping track of it this fall, this tracking season, the guys that uh, use lighted knocks are far more accurate in their assessment of where they think they hit the deer. And when we find the deer, you know, I'm taking pictures of this, the deer laying on the side. I flip it over, take a picture. I'm comparing on a grid, A, B, C, D, E, F, one, two, three, where do you think you hit the deer? And when we find it, I mark on that grid where they actually hit it. Hmm. And I put it, I give it a score. I think it's like zero to four, four being perfect, zero being just wrong. absolutely wrong. Yeah. And so the guys with lighted knocks are scoring a 2.7 or something like that. So they're fairly accurate. Some of them are off a little bit. The guys without lighted knocks are scoring a one point something. And wow. I hit it right behind the shoulder and then it's a foot you know, behind the shoulder. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, and that's something that, I, frankly, I'm guilty of. I, I went and tried some lighted knocks and just had some real inaccurate flight patterns and kind of went back off of them and stuff like that. And and maybe it's just because I haven't found the right one yet. But 
you know, I'm in that position. But I think to your point on the crossbows, that's a really good example. So my kids have a Raven. You know, it's a good way to get them in and get started. But that said, you know, they're shooting a 20 inch bolt that's like super lightweight with a hundred grain broadhead that's shooting 400 feet per second. Like, yeah, that, that you hit that deer in the shoulder. It's not blowing through. It's bouncing off, you know, and, and that's where, you know, some of these guys are coming out now with these 500 feet per second crossbows. And it's like, yeah, because you're shooting a super light setup there. Like that isn't necessarily the most beneficial to killing the deer, you know, but they're, and, and they're, they're buying the package. Yeah. And the most of them are actually shocked. I mean, they, you know, the like hunter calls me. It's like, um, I said, did you get a pass through? Well, I'm not sure. I didn't find my arrow, you know, and course, obviously they don't have a lighted knock on the bolt. Mm-hmm. And so they didn't see it go running off. And so they, I should have got a pass through. I'm shooting, you know, a crossbow that's shooting 500 feet per second. And I'm <laughs> like that, you know, but I tell them, I was like, that doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're shooting a super fast crossbow, I, I see a lot of crossbows with, without pass throughs, yep. even with the, the insane amount of draw width those things have. It just, yep. um, yeah. Yeah. It's just, again, it's the, it's the well, boulder, the arrow <laughs> build. That's kind of the misconception on they, those they things. Don't, they don't require like the intimacy with the weapon either to like understand the trajectory of your arrow and like mm-hmm. to, it, they just it doesn't require it like it like to be you know to be accurate with a, bu- a vertical bow bow and arrow you know you really have to practice with that thing and um over that course of time you get familiar with you know what it feels like when it goes off wh- where your arrow is actually hitting you're able to to you know become the arrow essentially i think with a crossbow just, you don't have to and so you know some oh, guys it's too fast man like even when i'm with my kids and they're shooting at the target at 30 yards yeah. in the backyard I mean, they, they pull the trigger and I mean, it's, it don't, it's there. And it's like, you know, I don't know how it flew, but it hit the right spot. Right. You know, yeah. imagine in a hunting situation in low light and you shoot out a deer, you have no idea where you get oh, that. No out. idea, no idea whatsoever. And, and, and that right there would worry me. Even if it was a good shot, it's every hunt, every shot. You Do I wait an hour before I track it? Yeah. Did I hit it where I think, where I was aiming? Yep. And I think a lot of that, uh, increases the odds of a guy tracking it too soon because Mm -hmm. you know obviously they think they hit where they they were aiming but that's not always the case yeah so they jump with you so shane what are what are some of the biggest like mistakes that you see guys making whether it's you know they jump right on a blood trail or you know they don't know where they hit the deer type of a deal what do you see number one is they track too soon yeah um you know the, the 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 age old um uh tip or whatever it is is to you make a shot on a deer wait an hour go track the deer or 30 minutes whatever it was that was what i was always taught in red magazines then in fall i was listening to him one day and he made a, a point that i totally agree with um you there's no sense in really waiting an hour you see like you'll see people like give it a couple more hours and then go track it you either made a good shot and the deer's dead within a couple minutes right or you made an iffy shot and that deer's going to live more than six hours it's it's not a like usually an in between like an hour and a half or two hours. It's easy, either they die fairly quickly or you need to give the deer overnight. You know, it's that situation a lot of times. Um, and I see that a lot. People make the, the mistake of tracking too soon, you know, because they have good blood. And I'll tell you now, people greatly un, uh, misunderstand what good blood is Mm -hmm. you know i could and i tell people a lot this a lot i could prick my finger and go through the woods dripping blood and have someone come and look at it and they'll say that's good blood if i told them i shot a deer um that is not good blood good (laughs) blood is like these pictures of where a rage went through a deer and you're poor that is good blood yeah i've seen deer track where they i mean where you could walk and follow blood and track them for 600 yards and they and it was a muscle hit you know so they, they see that, they get excited, they track too soon, they jump the deer, or they don't understand the anatomy of, of a deer. And they, um, I see this often, someone says, oh, yeah, I double lunged it. And they hit it right behind the shoulder, they say. And then when you find the deer, it was a liver hit. And the lungs, you know, make a sharp angle. And I think if people would take the time when they kill deer, when they gut it, don't just gut it and pull the guts out. Take your time and analyze it and, and learn where all the organs sit. And so you can make a better assessment of how soon to track uh, your deer. And I, I think that's what the main reasons people track too soon, either because they, uh, they think it was a lethal shot mm-hmm. and uh, they end up bumping the deer. And then, you know, once you bump a deer, your odds of recovery go way down. Um, 
it it's amazing um not necessarily because the deer is not going to die anymore it's now a deer was shot and it doesn't know that it was a, a predator did it something stung it you know and it runs a short distance now it feels sick it lays down beds down and dies whereas you start tracking it and you jump it now it just seen a, a predator us and now it's going to run six seven eight hundred yards to get away from that threat mm -hmm. so bumping is never a good thing um the other mistake um i, I just see a lot of bad advice on social media <laughs> Um, that's you don't a, say. A, that, that, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> no surprise there. That's where I get you all know, my best information. Take, somebody have to take a picture of the arrow or a couple of drops of blood on the ground or a little puddle where the deer stood. Like, yep, yeah, anyway. long hit for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll see guys like, dead deer, go get your deer. Dead, <laughs> like, there is not enough information in that few pictures. Yeah. If, if you've gotten to the point that you had to make a Facebook post to ask other people's opinions that, deer's gone. that is the time that you should back out and wait till tomorrow morning or even i would suggest getting a <laughs> yeah facebook again. poll keep going here's my button <laughs> yeah. go. and and you know who they're going to listen to the hunter if he makes a post he's not going to listen to the 30 comments that says i would get back out and get a dog maybe yeah. or whatever. he's going to listen to those two guys that say that's a dead deer go get it dead deer that's go, so go. funny man it, it it is true and i mean anybody that bow hunts long enough like listen you, you ultimately are going to make a marginal hit in your career right it just it's gonna happen you know the guys who tell me all the time they're like nah like i've never made a bad hit and i'm like well you either haven't hunted enough or haven't taken enough shots you know because you're going to at some point in time and it's a sick feeling but i think what really bugs me shane is that it seems like a lot of people give up on blood trails way too quick. Like they'll literally, you must walk to the moment of impact and they're like, well, I don't see anything, you know? And, yeah. and they're like, okay, yeah, and I guess bad hit and like walk away. Well, if it's, if, if those are the guys that back out and call a dog, we love those guys. Because <laughs> the, track, the track is clean yeah. and they haven't, you know, and I, I get it. If you're new to hunting, you, you're going to make mistakes. you got to learn this stuff. And if you don't have a mentor to show you this stuff and basically, um, you know, learn as much as you can by watching videos or whatever, if you're new to it, yep. there was a point I was going to make about, um, gosh, I, I want to make a point about that earlier thing about the, the, the tracks that you were mentioning. What did, what did you start off your sentence talking about, uh, just now as it walk up to the end, like, yeah, just end of a blood trail. And they're just like, oh, I don't see anything. Uh, Okay, There's, I can't remember. I'll think of it in a little bit, but there was there was a point I was going to make. That well, I so was so you're saying there, okay, like you would almost rather have that guy not follow and like start trailing versus I, you know, I'm not sure. Let me back out, keep the trail clean, and call well, call you in. No, I, I say that I say that lightly as a tracker from a tracking standpoint. Sure. We love clean tracks because it's so much easier for the dog to follow the deer. Gotcha. So when we train, I'll I'll touch on this a little bit. When we train a dog to track a wounded deer, you know, a deer that's been shot, um, they, they leave blood sometimes, um, even if it's small specks that we can't find. We train them to track the interdigital gland between the hooves. Each deer is individual, just like the fawn can follow its mother or a buck can follow a doe or, or mm -hmm. a doe can follow its sister doe or whatever. They, they're individual. And what I've been told, and, and I don't, I can't say for fact, it's just what I've read and been told that deer that are injured release other odors that signify, you know, pheromones or, or, mm -hmm. or and, and whatever the, the term is for them that uh, dogs can pick up on. And I believe it because think of a deer you shoot and a coyote finds it within an hour or two. For sure. Those coyotes, those coyotes are not just going through the woods and following every deer trail until they come up on a dead deer. That coyote come through the woods, cut across the, the path that deer ran, smells that injury scent, you know, the odors it put off and said, that is a sick or wounded deer and follows it and finds your carcass. And then it, you, you find your deer the next morning eating up by coyotes. So that's what the, the dogs were training. We're training them to trail wounded deer. And once even a deer that's wounded after it calms down, you know, it runs for a while, maybe a gut shot deer. Maybe it's calmed down. It's not dumping all those wounded odors anymore or fear odors. Mm -hmm. The dog can still track that particular deer by its individual gland scent. And, um, and so um, when a guy doesn't track a deer, so if a, so let me back up. So if a guy shoots a deer and he goes in and tracks it and he loses blood and he calls his four buddies, 
and they start you know, grid searching. What they've done is while they were tracking is they're picking up scent molecules of the blood, those uh, wounded right. odors, the interdigital gland scent. They're getting it all over the shoes. Now these four or five guys branch off to the woods to grid search. The dog doesn't know that. He's following, okay, here's deer A. Now deer A went here, 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 here. Which one do I follow? Mm -hmm. The dog can't figure out where is the real deer. He thought, you know, think of it, uh, the good analogy is think of a playground or a local park after a fresh blanket of snow and somebody walked across there. That's what the dog sees on a clean track. Now imagine it's lunchtime and, and all morning people have been walking through there. Um, that's what the dog sees when you grid search. Now there's a you know, hundred different sets of tracks and which one is the, you know, you could not follow an individual through all those tracks Man. of snow. That's crazy. So, imagine how much further that's complicated by it. <clears throat> and you may know the term for this, Shane. Again, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know this to be, to be the fact, but I've heard this and it I've, seems like it is the case. You know, I don't think dogs have the ability like, like humans or e even mice, uh, for whatever reason, can like they can do a maze. They can like go to the end of something and be like, okay, not here, back out, go try the next. And by process of elimination, we can ultimately make it like to the end of a destination. I don't think dogs have that. W whatever that cognitive ability is, they're not able to like look at one and be like, okay, that's off the list, go to the next. They'll just keep going back to the same place and be like, I guess it's not this one. Yeah. Um they will, um, I don't know if this is exactly what you're thinking. They will, uh, they have a way of figuring out things. Like for instance, I can go down a deer trail with, or track, uh, tracking a deer with Callie mm -hmm. and we get to a spot. There's three different trails. She will check trails. She'll branch off. She doesn't smell that deer. She comes back to where she last smelled it eh. and she checks this trail. And then, and then she's like, okay, here, yeah. went down this trail. Maybe there's a gap in the scent, but then she, she's smart enough to check those trails. I don't know how she knows this, you know, but I've seen her do it. Um, that 33 hour old track, she did that. Mm -hmm. She checked that trail. Um, she does sometimes what I call a frustration bark. She'll go check a trail. And when she stops, she'll lift her head and bark once and then run back. And I don't know why. I can't she imagine that. what she's saying. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Damn it. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to go back real quick about the, the, the track where the guy that goes out there and can't find blood and quick gives up. A, so as a tracker from a tracking standpoint, we love those because those are clean tracks. Right. Nobody's right? nobody's contaminated um, the site, basically. Yeah. But what I would like this guys to see, even if you're new, you know, if you don't know a whole lot about track, I mean, you, you number one is after the shot, you know, I know it's exciting, especially if it's your first deer. And I've seen guys do this. They shoot a deer and they're so quick to hop on their phone and text their buddies or get on Facebook and smoked one, you know. But you need to, as soon as you shoot, you need to listen. You know, even if it's 30 seconds, uh, a minute, even longer, listen for everything, you know, watch the deer run off, mark, visibly mark, mm -hmm. like it ran by that tree, listen for sounds of it falling, um, perhaps if you're lucky, if it didn't go far, you know, and, and then, you know, go down and you know, mark where the deer was standing visibly and then go down there and mark it with something, a piece of tissue, preferably, um, because that's easy to see and it, you know, a couple of rains and it washes the tissue away. We're flagging, you know, um, some people like to use flag and that stays there forever. Um, and then, and then mark your trail as you look, but the other thing is don't just randomly go through the woods, look, but deer will, if you shoot a deer, you know, they may blindly take off running just to get away from that, you know, whatever shot them, but they'll hit a deer trail pretty soon. So you don't have to go through the thick brush and whatever. If you walk off to one side of the deer trail, so you're not picking up that extra scent or reducing the odds of it, walk deer trails out 30, 40 yards and you can maybe find a speck of blood that way. Deer typically stick to deer trails, even yeah. when they're shot and running away. Yeah. Um, there's a, I mean, we could go in a whole long discussion about tracking, but I'll, Let's I'll do leave it. it up to you. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, I'm sure it happens a lot, but like, <laughs> A lot of the you know blood trail and stuff can be kind of common sense. It's like, it's like where where do you think you hit the deer? Uh, you know what kind of blood? Do you, what what does the arrow look like? You know you have this evidence and stuff. It's like okay, we can make a decision about whether to, to track the deer now or give them some time. But I I know for me personally, and I think you know guys that we've hunted with, that all kind of gets um, 
you know, some urgency put on it or, you know, maybe gets like thrown out the window uh, when we have some adverse conditions, like mainly rain, anything that would really obstruct our, you know, the blood trail is there or our ability to kind of, you know, track the animal in the direction that we, th- we thought that it wants. So, so I'm curious, you know, with a dog or, or maybe to those guys who are going to try without a dog initially, like how do you, how do you treat that stuff? Yeah. So, uh, like the rain affects a human ability to follow deer trail because we're using sight, you know, yeah. basically, um, rain does not affect a dog, uh, uh capability to scent actually moisture seems to make it easier. Hmm. Uh, I've been on tracks where like, for instance, a guy shot a deer. He thought it was a good shot. Ended up being a gut shot. Um, it was dry, uh, dry conditions, uh, standing bean field. Um, I couldn't get to it till the next day because I was on a youth hunt with my daughter. I came out the next day and this was about 26 hours after he shot the deer. And we hadn't tracked one that old yet. Um, this was a Callie's first or second season, maybe her second season. When I arrived, it started misting rain. And when I put her on that track. It was like that deer was just shot. She had no, she followed it to where he lost blood. The deer had actually jumped the fence and headed north. And that's where they found last last blood. She took me to that spot, sniffed around a little bit, and then went due south to a property line. I stopped her, brought her back. The guy said, yeah, we have permission to track on that property. I said, all right, I'll start her last blood again and see where she takes us. Well, she took us due south again. We crossed that property line, another 300 yards to a small little pond. She sniffed around that pond and was had her nose right on the surface. It was like glass, it was just a little small water hole. And I was thinking, is this deer in the water? You know, does she smell the scent? But she went along the edge of the pond and she came up the bank on the other side and about 15 yards away under a little small oak tree was the deer had, it had bedded and expired. And I think what she was smelling was the scent was pooling down and settling on the surface of the water. The thermals were pulling it down. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but the, the point is that that moisture, she, if you, I think the video, yeah, it's still on my channel. She's, bounding and barking she didn't have her nose to the ground she could smell it so easily wow and so for a dog you know for for a human when it rains it washes the blood away or makes it harder to notice because especially at night with a flashlight everything is glistening yeah and so it's hard to pick up the specs the only time i think like rain becomes an issue is when you get torrential downpours you know you're talking two or three inches over the course of the night if it's just a, a steady, moderate rain where it's not enough to cause, you know, you know streams of running water through the woods, your gully washer. If it's just a, a steady rain where it can soak in, it doesn't uh, basically disperse the scent where they can't track it anymore. I don't think water itself destroys it. It's just when you get a lot of it, it just washes it away. Mm-hmm. So imagine... So imagine you lay a chalk line on a soccer field or a football field. If it's just a, a steady rain, the chalk's still going to be visible. But if you've got two inches of torrential downpours, it may wash that chalk away where we visibly can't see it anymore. So I think it's the same thing happening for scent. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and like I said, it seems to make it stronger for the dog or easier from the smell. And the analogy I use a lot of times is, you know, if you've, if you've been around a dog that's dry, you know, you pet him and whatever, and then he goes out and gets in the rain and comes back in a wet dog. You can really smell it much stronger. It seems to, uh, just from my experience, it seems to invigorate that scent trail. I think it's doing it for the dog. So uh, snow is another thing that you may encounter. Um, you know, less than yeah. six inches is what the kind of the train of thought is. Um, track the Cali tracks very well in, you know, a couple of inches of snow, even after the deer was shot and snows after we don't get to see the, you know, we can't follow the tracks in the snow because snow is covering, you know, if there was already snow and more snow on top, but the dog has no problem following the scent in that in wow. condition. Well, I think, um, to the moisture thing, isn't that, uh, doesn't have more to do with like the, the nose than it does the actual, like the thing that's being, sm- I mean, yeah. It doesn't have something to do with like their olfactory glands, like on the outside of their nose. That's why deer, when they're trying to smell you, you know, same as a, a dog. Lick, lick, lick nose, yeah. yeah, they're always licking their um, nose or because the analogy that I like to use is you ever notice like your fart in the shower smells a lot worse than it does. <laughs> 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 yeah. Same, same basic same, principle. Same thing. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Fart smell bad, period. <laughs> yeah, but in the shower, you know, only yeah. you would know. I guess. It'll hit you <laughs> faster. Gives you the care. Yeah, 
yeah, it seems to be like if there's any like uh, a, a additional moisture, it seems to be helpful. Like early in the mornings when we track, and um, a lot of times I don't like tracking early in the morning when there's a lot of dew, uh, just because my, my dog at least, um, and and I know there's dogs out there that are better trained or, or you know trackers with much more experience than I do and, and know what they're doing or or more along the lines of what they're doing. Um, Callie seems to uh, maybe she just smells so many things first thing in the morning was a lot of moisture content and she it's hard to get her to settle down plus she slept all night now she's ramped up and ready to go she loves tracking when I when I grab her tracking uh, thing and say you, you want to go on a mission that's the key word mission I can say fishing it sounds close enough that she she perks up and starts wagging her tail but she's ramped up and raring, uh, raring to go early in the morning and there's so much odor out there that it's sometimes hard to get her to sell down. So I, I typically like for the dew to get burnt off a little bit, mm. but yeah, it's just the moisture, just a little bit of moisture helps them track in very dry conditions. It's tough. There's an area I laid a practice track and it was dry that day. It's up here. And we have some areas of Minnesota that are real sandy um, and a little bit of grass growing in. It's almost like walking on the uh, sand dune or something, but then there's grass it's tough for them to track in that dry, sandy conditions. Um, pine trees or pine forests are another difficult thing for them to track in. I asked about this and I was told that because of the, in the forest floor of under pine trees is very acidic mm -hmm. and that destroys scent molecules. So I've laid practice tracks where we've been in pines and the track, the pr training track or practice track comes out into like a grassy field or something. Where both Callie and my dog in training both struggled in those pines to stay on the track. As soon as they cleared the pines, they were spot on. So um, there's a lot of variables that can affect moisture. Definitely helps, and and where dry conditions hurt. And then the, the where you're tracking a pine forest is not good. Um, dirt, just bare dirt or pavement is not good. Um, things like that that don't hold scent very well. Um, Anything else you want to touch No, on that's perfect. Point? I'm curious. So how, um, do you want to talk to us about like the training process at all? Is this something that like, if I, if I have a dog with a good nose that I could, can I train my dog to do this? Yeah, I think, um, the consensus among, uh, trackers and, and in this, this field is, um, any dog can be trained to track a wounded deer. Um, uh, some seem to do better than others. And I think like a lot of people use a little wire hair dots and a little small wiener dog type uh, breeds. Yeah. Um, I use a, a blue tick coon hound. It's good for that type of thing for scenting. Um, some people use blood hounds. So ba basically any dog can, can do it or be trained to do it. I don't know how easy it is to train an older dog to do it. I get that question a lot. I don't have experience training an older dog. Every dog I've owned in my life, if I had it trained for a, a particular purpose, hunting or tracking, I always got them as pups and trained them. So I don't know the how easy it is to train an old dog. I've heard it, that you can do it. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure that it's a little more difficult. Yeah. Uh, the training process for me, you know, obviously we're not tracking blood or <clears throat> if the hunter loses, you know, if, if we, if we train the dog to track blood, then the hunter really doesn't need us because if there's blood, they can just follow it. You right. know, uh, was always my thought. And I did a lot of reading and research on this, uh, early on. I know there's some people that, that use blood to train their dogs. I prefer to use hooves, hooves only, and hooves from deer that were wounded and ran off so that if they are dumping those extra wounded odors, they're getting on those legs, those hooves. I use like a, a, the last foot of the hoof. Hmm. I, introduced, I introduced my dogs early on as a pup, you know, eight weeks, nine weeks old, to a deer hoof from a deer that was wounded, you know, shot with a bow or a gun, if, as long as it ran off, you know, 100 yards or whatever. And I introduce them, let them play with it. And then I tie it to a string and go out in the yard and, and make a 15 yard track, bring the dog out there and have them follow it, make a game out of it for them. And I quit, quickly progress to walk in the hoof, you know, simulating an uh, injured deer walking and extending the, the each practice track, extending the length of that track. And then over time, once they get that down pat, increasing the age of the track, you know, lay a practice track, age at six hours. You know, once they get that down, age of 12 hours, once they get that down. And then you want to introduce 
um, distractions. Like a dog, like Callie is bad about this. I wish I'd done more training on this early on with her, but we can be tracking a deer and, and a, a deer maybe crossed the trail, a different deer crossed the trail 30 minutes before we got there. She smells all that scent. Now she wants to follow that. She starts barking and baying. And, and I usually know that she's tracking the wrong deer when she does that. So in your training to correct that is lay a practice track. Your dogs learn to, you know, you're in the advanced stages of training. The dogs learn to follow this trail right before you bring the dog on the track. Say it's been aged 12 hours. Take a piece of deer hide, thaw it out of your freezer from a different deer and drag it, you know, at a hundred yards down the practice track, drag it across it and leave it over here somewhere. When the dog or pup gets to that point, and if it wants to take that fresh hot track, correct them, restart them, and teach them that no, you're going to stick onto this deer. And I wouldn't even leave a prize at the end of the. I wouldn't even leave the, the hide. Actually, you don't want them to find a prize or a reward. So you only want the reward to be on the deer you put the trail mm-hmm. you put them on. Um, when I'm collecting deer hooves for training. Every track I go on and we have a recovery, I ask the hunter, can I have the hooves? And I'll cut them off at the, the joints. They're like, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And I, I explain to them why. They, usually they don't have a problem. As long as they're not getting it, the deer mounted, like even if they're getting the deer mounted, they don't use the. Yeah. Unless they're doing the old school, like hold the arrow yeah. hook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I bring those deer hooves home. I vacuum seal them together. And I only use two at a time. So I, I may take the two back hooves and back and seal them together and I'll label them yep. what the, the date, what the deer was. It was a doe, you know, and the date, because it could be during the rut or whatever. I, I want to know where that deer came from and I keep them segregated from the other. Ones. I mean, they're in the freezer together, but I do not put them all in the one bag and just grab hooves. Yep. I want it to be as non, um, you know, cross contamination as possible. I don't want to accidentally grab a hoof from a, a doe and one from a buck and, We'll strap them to tracking shoes and yeah. to walk with to create that fake trail. Yeah. And it's just going to confuse the dog if you're using the hooves from different deer. I don't use, I did this early on. I would find a roadkill deer and I'd go out there and cut the hooves off of it. That right there is just a deer that got hit by a car. It died instantly. Yeah. It didn't. So basically when you're using a hoof from a deer that's gunshot and dropped in its tracks or a deer was hit by a car, you're training your dog to, to, to follow deer in general. I want them to to learn to track wounded deer. Makes sense. And, and that helps out later on when you get into actually tracking for others. The dog, you know, may track a deer that was shot in the briskets, for instance. And uh, that deer's jumping, uh, dumping those odors of a wounded deer. But after the deer goes wild, it starts clotting up, it licks his wound. It's lost that fear. It's not dumping all those wounded deer odors or fear odors. Now the deer is just leaving deer scent. A lot of these dogs, um, when they're properly trained, and I hear a lot of trackers say this, their dogs will start indicating this deer is not lethally wounded. It doesn't want to follow it anymore. And I've seen that with Callie, and that's how I've determined, okay, this is not a lethally wounded deer. We've tracked it for 400 yards. She has no interest to follow it anymore. And so, you know, that's kind of the, in a nutshell, I know it was a long, no, that's no, crazy. That's, well, and that's what I was going to ask. Is there uh, <clears throat> you know, if you, if a dog gets super honed in on, on a trail, you know, and again, you know, maybe it's not nine times out of 10, but at least 50 or 60% of the time guy isn't sure about where exactly he hit it. Like you guys could follow that trail for hours and, and really not have a reward at the end of the trail because that deer was hitting the brisket or it was a leg wound or whatever. So I, that's what I was going to ask is when does that, when do you hit that spot where it's kind of like you go to the guy and it's like, listen, man, this deer has gone two miles and he ain't dying. Well, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm still learning as a tracker. I, I only have five years experience. And um, so here's my kind of my thing for myself to satisfy hunters is if, on deer that we recover, Callie does very well if the deer is dead and we usually recover it within, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. You know, there's been tracks where it's been taken longer. Right? There was one track that took us two days. I tracked it part of that day. We backed out overnight to give the deer more time because we found a fresh drop of blood, came back and we tracked, you know, for a number of hours the next day. And we found that deer 22 hours after you shot it, 1.3 miles away. Hmm. But in most cases, we put her on the 
uh, put her on the track. She takes us to the deer and we're there, you know, easily 30 minutes or less. The majority of my tracks, we find the deer. But I will make every effort to put the hunter's mind at ease. You know, if she's, if Callie decides, okay, I'm, I'm not interested in track this, I will grid search with her nose. You know, I'll let her run multiple lines. She'll pick a different line. She'll take me. And we will, you know, work the wind because she can cover, you know, 50 to 100 yards of woods with her nose. And if, if there's a deer laying there, she'll smell it in the wind and take me right to it. We found deer like that before. It's not usually the case. But uh, I will expend, um, you know, two to three hours searching with the dog, even if we cannot get locked onto the deer. And and usually that puts the hunter's mind at ease. Usually they're the ones that call it and say, yeah, we haven't found any blood. That We've covered a lot of area. Um, the, I think the deer, I think I agree. The deer is not more. Right. Needed. And, um, and typically in most cases, if it's a home body deer, deer, that they have on trail camera in the, uh, in the past, a deer they're familiar with those deer, if they're not le- lethally wounded, show back up on camera within a week or so mm-hmm. during the rut. It's a big different story. It's a buck. They just saw for the first time they shoot it and wound it. Even if they just, you know, hit it across the top of the back. It's not a wounded or lethally uh, wounded deer. That deer heads back to his home range and they never see it again. Yeah. So those are the ones that leave our heads, you know, scratching our heads, you know, did this deer actually die? But, um, but like I said, if you you leave a trail camera out after we're done, usually you get a picture within a week or less. Oh, I I remember, I remember now what (laughs) uh, what earlier just popped in my head. You were talking about uh, the guy that makes a lethal hit. Mm-hmm. Um, I, can't, I can't remember the exact context of it, but you were talking about they, yeah, I shot it here. It's a lethal one to hit. Um, or I made a bad hit. It's going to, you were talking about, it's going to happen. Yeah, it's going to happen. Point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So those guys, what they failed to realize, and I've tracked it and seen, I wouldn't have believed it myself had I not seen it myself over the you know, course of tracking and sharing it with other or other trackers sharing their stories. Even when you make a perfect shot, doesn't always mean the deer is going to die. I've tracked a deer a few years ago. The guy shot it double long, perfect shot. This way he described it, you know, right here. And it had to exit you know, around the armpit, somewhere in that area. It was perfect broadside. The deer went out there and laid down, bedded down. Another deer came there and nudged up. The deer moved a little bit and bedded down. He snuck out of there. He came back four or five hours later with his dad. The deer was gone. I came in there and tracked it like 30 hours later, 20, you know, 28, 30 hours later. And Callie seemed to track it pretty good. But then she lost interest. And it was just pretty open terrain with a couple of little woodlots. We, tra- we checked everywhere. Could not find this deer. I'm like, man, if you if you're right in your assessment, this deer should be dead. Six days later, he sends me a trail cam picture of this deer. You can see the hole right here. A day or two later, he sends me another trail cam picture of the other side. You can see the exit hole right here. And then a few days later, he sends me another trail cam picture of the deer breeding a doe in front of the camera. And I can't remember how much longer later the deer got hit by a car and and died. And so he was Jeez. able to put his hands on it. And in all, in, you know, there's no possible way that that arrow did not pass through both lungs and that deer survived. You know, yeah. it was already starting to heal up. How long would it, how long would it have lived afterwards? Who's to say had it not got hit by a car? But the point that I'm getting at, you know, that excuse a lot of guys say it's all about shot places. Just make a good shot. You know, if you, mm-hmm. you know, when someone makes a bad shot, they instantly uh, give them grief about it and say, you know, you need to practice more, you know, those guys. Yeah. But even, even with a perfect shot does not always mean that you're going to be able to follow a blood trail to a dead deer. And you don't necessarily, you know, there's sometimes when you need a dog, even if you did everything right, is what I'm getting at. Well, and I think to that point, like I'll, uh, when I was, man, I don't know, 14, 14 or something, I shot a a buck with a a shotgun and slugs. And I mean, I, I probably, it would have been high, but damned if I wouldn't have caught both lungs. And I'm talking, you know, when you say good blood, I mean, you're standing 100 yards away and you're like, there he goes, you know, right down there. And what we did is it was during gun season. There was 12 of us, right? Everybody immediately, boom, let's just get on this trail. Let's go pick this deer up. It just kept bumping them, bumping them, bumping them. And I mean, I'm talking like, look like somebody had a five-gallon paint 
you know, can with them, just dropping blood the whole way, and then just stop, right? And it's like, that deer should be dead. The shot probably was lethal, but we jumped on that trail within five minutes of the shot, and we just kept pushing that deer until eventually, like, you know, we couldn't find them. And so, like, shot placement was fine. Weapon of choice was fine. But, you know, we didn't we didn't wait long enough. Had we backed off for an hour, that deer probably would have went 20 yards, bedded down, just bled himself out right there. Instead, we pushed him 900 yards and just kept going and going until we couldn't find him anymore. Yeah. And, the, yeah, the farther they go, the, the odds of recovery go way down. It seems, because they got more places to hide. Exactly. You have more, you have more areas that you have to, to, to search. What did you say you shot it with again? 12 slug? gauge with slug. Yep. Okay. I'm wondering, I imagine it passed through these hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, it, and it was high, you know, but it was still definitely at least in close lung and, you know, he was bedded when I had shot at him. Uh, I was just walking through the woods and I mean, I'm, I'm serious. It was one of the most devastating blood trails I'd ever seen. And like, at one point I remember, you know, I'm a 14 year old kid and my dad's like, Hey, like, we're not, we're not going to find this deer now. And I'm like, what do you mean? You know, like if I follow blood trail for 700 yards and like, there's no more blood left in this deer. He's like, Shh, no, beer 30. <laughs> We're going back to camp. Yeah. <laughs> but I tell you, as growing up as, uh, when I first got into hunting pretty young, I hope that dog, you can't hear. Uh, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Is that Callie? Um, that's the Jasper. Oh, okay. He, he's probably barking at Callie. Callie's laying on the bed in the other room, looking out the window. He's probably wanting to play and she won't. Give him any <laughs> um, but yeah, early on when I first started hunting, I don't know why, but it seemed like anytime I shot a deer and I drew blood, I just assumed that deer was good as dead. Yeah. You know, that's, that was my train of thought. And I still kind of had that thought when you put an arrow through a deer, you know, not too many years ago, that that deer was probably going to die. But it, tracking has taught me that deer are very resilient. I mean, they live out in the wild. They fight each other. They gore yeah. each other they are built to survive injuries and you know tracking has shown me that there's it's crazy the number of deer we track the injuries they take and they end up surviving you know so um yeah if you I, I guess what i'm trying to tell the viewers or listeners is if you shoot a deer and the deer you, know, you do everything right don't get bummed out um and you know beat yourself up too much because it is you know even with doing everything right, it's, it's possible that deer can uh, beat the odds. They are resilient. So, I mean, do you, you think, uh, like, if I'm if I'm any hunter listening to this thing and I, I make a shot, if I don't see that deer go down and die within sight, uh, would your recommendation be, like, just back out and give it time? No, not necessarily. Um, where did you hit the deer? If I shoot a yeah. deer and I think it's a lethally hit deer, I think it was a great shot. And yep. you know, that goes back to learning the anatomy of a deer. So yep. many hunters I track for, they think it was double long and it's actually farther back. It doesn't take much to yeah. get too far back. Um, <clears throat> or hit too high. Yeah. It's amazing how many people don't realize the right in the shoulder blade area, the spine drops way low. And that's because it's got to connect to the spine, you know, the spine's coming down out of the neck and it yep. ends up. So They'll hit it and say, oh, it's double lung, and it's actually above the spine. Yep. And there's still a number of people out there, it's amazing, that believe there's a void below the spine that you can hit below the spine and above the lungs. It's not possible. No man's but land. It, yeah. I, I I call no man's land is the area above the spine. It's called backstrap or you know neck meat. Um, so that you get that a lot. But, you know, those tracks, the deer's not going to die anyway, so it's not going to hurt for you to track too soon if you just sure. get a, a meat hit. But if you if you make a lethal, lethal hit, you know, low, lower third of the body, right right in the vital V or right behind the leg, you know, track your deer. You know, you can track it within 15 minutes. I usually take my time getting out of my stand, so it's usually about an hour before mm -hmm. I have everything down packed up. I'm in no hurry to go find this deer unless it's hot or something. Um, but if you shoot one back, it all depends on where you hit it, basically, mm -hmm. when it determines when you track it. If you hit it back, liver, guts, give it overnight. If you're in the morning, give it most of the day. Uh, you can track it in the afternoon before it gets dark. That will really help you because um, daylight obviously helps you track better. Um, but, so basically, it comes down to where you hit it. And, um, you know, if you don't, it's hard to, to give a, a, a concrete answer because sure. there's a lot of variables involved. 
you know, look at the arrow. What does it look like? Yep. What does it smell like? How many people are out there smelling the arrows? You know, you don't yeah. see it. You don't ever see it on videos hardly. No. But the first thing I do, even when I make a perfect shot, I, I look at the blood, then I smell it for any foul odor. Blood should smell like blood if it's a good hit, clean blood. If you get into the liver and liver has a little tinge of, uh, I just call it stank, a little stank to it, not mm-hmm. bad. Um, and um, and then you get into the guts, obviously that smells bad. Yeah. And then you, you got to look at the color of the arrow. Um, those things all determine when you should track it. But if, if you think you made a good hit and you didn't see the deer go down, the only reason I would call to get a tracker is – you want to guarantee you find that. And I, I, yeah. I want to find every, I want to find every deer I shoot. I treat them all equally. Yep. But there, there are some guys that would rather they shot a 150 inch buck or a 200 inch buck. They want to guarantee to find it back out and get you a dog. You know, that'll get you the best odds. Now, with that said, if you go track your deer and then you start the blood trail starts peering out or you're worried because now you've tracked it 250 or 300 yards, it's starting to worry Mark last blood with some tissue and just back out. Yep. Grid search, grid searching should be your last resort. A dog is not your first resort, but it should definitely come before grid search. Well, and that's what I was going to say. It seems like a lot of guys, when they basically get off blood, I, I say get off blood more than even peter out because I think it just ends up, you know, getting spaced out more and more. And eventually they're like, oh, there's no more blood. There is. You just aren't following that trail enough and then they immediately go to grid search and they're like oh let me just walk yeah. this whole area and that's that's, yeah, that's, that's definitely an, an issue people grits are too readily grid search after they start the deer the blood trail you know the way i track is you know if i get a drop of blood i'll put a piece of tissue yep i stand there and okay there's two trails here that's so it like man I yeah like i mentioned earlier deer tend to stick to trails yeah. And you can tell whether they're running. I mean, you can look at the clues. It ain't just following, you know, breadcrumbs. You got to look at all the clues, the tracks, how far they're spaced apart, the blood. And did it splatter or did it drip down straight? It tells you if the deer is still running. Is it a smear? You know, all these things you got to look at. And so, like, if there's two trails in front of you, mark last blood, yep. step off to the trail and walk that 20, 30 yards real slow. Don't be in a hurry to yep. speed along thinking there's going to be a drop that will easily be. Uh, visible come back and check the next trail mm-hmm. you know and and like i say always stay off the trail if you can to, to reduce contamination of your shoes and spreading the scent around um but you know that's the way i go about it and then after you search for an hour or whatever you know checking the trails um then maybe back out but, but yeah like you said a lot of people too easily like well let's let's, let's, start right right here somewhere. let's take yeah. these bushes over here I'm sure Shane would like to hear the outcome of, of this buck right here. I'll get I'll get into that. I want to. You brought up something about like the blood trailing miss, and I think this is a cool one because there's just certain things like I've heard, and I'm sure other people have heard. Like one is like let's say it's a liver shot or gut shot deer. Like a lot of times it ends up at water. Do you find that true? No, and um, I on my spreadsheet that I keep stats with. I mean, it happens mm-hmm. occasionally, mm-hmm. but it's so infre- infrequent that by no means should it be advice to, i mean it seems like that was something i was taught growing up like if you got oh. off the trail and couldn't find it it's like oh just go look by the ponds and the the creeks yeah. like he'll be dead there it, it's uh the number one bit of advice you see uh given on social media or whatever these days so out of all the tracks i've been on in my spreadsheet i keep it uh you know a log of where the deer was found in relation to water within 50 yards of water you know, whether it went there intentionally or not, yep. if it just happened to fall over dead next to a stream 50 yards away, I mark it as found near water. Yep. Now, I also put a note there, okay, do I think the deer intentionally went to the water? Like the gut shot when I found, it was bedded up next to a tree next to a little pond. I bet it went there and drank some water and bedded down next to the tree. You know, there was another instance where we tracked the deer and we didn't find it, but it was found six days later by the neighbors laying dead next to the pond. It was a liver slash gut shot. That deer, um, we presume, based on the amount of decomp, that that deer had not died very. Re- I mean, it had died very recently. Mm-hmm. That it lived for several days, and it got thirsty and went and bedded down next to water. Those cases, yeah, they went to if the deer lives long enough. Mm-hmm. But after a deer is shot, that's not the first thing they're thinking of. They're just fleeing the danger, 
if they start feeling sick from a liver or a gut shot, they bed down because they feel sick. And then they, that's usually where they die unless you bump them. Mm -hmm. The reason a lot of people find deer next to water is on the rare occasion that the deer lives, you know, 12, 24, 36 hours or longer, they get thirsty and they may get up and walk over there. The, the, the main reason they find them by water is the water is an obstruction is a creek, you know, yeah. deer runs off, it goes down the bottom the hill, doesn't want to cross the, the river or the creek, it beds down next to it. You know, it's a wall for that deer, or there's a swamp. We found mm-hmm. them like that. But back to my stats, Minnesota and Wisconsin, the, the surface area of Minnesota and Wisconsin is 32 point something percent water. Mm-hmm. That's swamp, swamps, lakes, streams, everything. So 32% of the surface is water. One one or two percent of the deer we've recovered have been within 50 yards of water. Wow. So, mm-hmm. so you would think if deer mm-hmm. are not even you'd think that just by the average <laughs> yeah. that you should find 32 percent of the deer by water. Yeah. And if you're if they're intentionally going there, it should be even much higher than that. Wow. So my stats indicate that the deer aren't going to a water, they're just running from you and they're dying. And they just have to come up on a stream. Or they try to swim across the creek, and you know, and that's enough of a burden to the where they expire in the creek or the pond. Um, so, if I was telling somebody to grid search and look for a deer, my advice would be to follow your trails in one general direction. Mm-hmm. All the deer that we recover and we plot the course they ran. Most deer don't do a big J hook and come back around. You know, occasionally that happens. You know, for whatever reason, maybe the deer ran over here. So a car went down the road and scared them back that way. But in normal, uh, overall, I'd say maybe not normal. I shouldn't use that word, but in overall, a deer, when it runs away from you tends to stay in that general direction. And we find them. If you made a cone away from where the shot location, you'd find your deer in that. cone yeah, area. So follow, if it got to a grid search and follow your trails off in that area and work it back and forth. And the cone gets a little wider and wider the farther yeah. you get, obviously. Yeah. But I think that would have much higher odds of finding your deer blindly, you know, grid searching, than just randomly checking streams and ponds and stuff. Well, that's it, man. I mean, there's so many like that. Uh, wounded deer won't go up a hill. Oh, they're always, you know, they'll circle back to where the initial impact happened because they want to know what happened. Like all these things that are flying around on social media, or we were raised growing up, and it's like, no, like those are, they're not accurate. Yeah, the deer go up a hill just as readily as they go down a hill when they're injured. Yeah. Um, the only thing that keeps them from going up a hill if, if they're so injured, they're too weak or they're. Yeah. You, know, you shot them through both leg bones and their front legs and they can't go. Yeah, up they're a hill. snow plowing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what were you going to say, Jerry? Uh, I was, I guess I was just going to ask about <clears throat> in terms of, um, you know, heading back to, to cover. And then midway through thinking of that question, I started thinking about what there's kind of a, there's a difference between like a, eminently and lethally hit animal that's just like flee the scene and then shortly after they're dead there's probably yeah. not like a thought process of like oh back to cover or conceal myself or water or whatever it is but at some point it's like okay if it's you know if it's a six or, or longer hour at some point the deer's like okay immediate threat's gone um wh- what am i going to do and i guess my kind of my part two of that question is like does it seem like they ultimately want to get back to like like an a known bedding area or, or like an area of security to, to where the, the hunter's like, oh, oh, it makes sense that he's coming back here. Like it seems like he comes from this area quite a bit. Yeah, we I see that. Um, deer, like you said, deer that are mortally wounded that are going to die within you know, a short period after the shot, they usually just run from the fear. Even if they calm down, start walking, and they bed down just in place, and then they expire. Deer that live longer and have time to think about what's going on, we usually see one of several things first thing is they bed down and watch their back trail i've seen that a number of times when we track a deer there it is up ahead laying behind a deadfall or something watching its back trail um they didn't necessarily go to cover but it it did have the cognitive or ability or thought process to look back there's a predator after yeah keep eye behind me um the other thing i see is if they live long enough they will search out like bedding they're familiar with or try to get back to where they came from. Like there was a doe we tracked that came out from bedding. The hunter shot it, it ran across the field and it made a loop. We followed it back right to that bedding. Yeah. And, and you see that even with deer you shoot that are mortally wounded that die pretty quick. 
you know, you shoot them and they're facing this way, they do a loop and go right back that way. Mm-hmm. So they, they do sometimes try to get back to, to areas, but, um, you know, it's the ones that live longer, have calmed down and have, a, you know, are able to think about what my next move is to, to stay safe. And they'll, you know, in those situations, I think that's why the myth about water sometimes occurs. Uh, the deer that live long enough, they head to thicker cover. Where is thicker cover usually at? It's usually around water, you mm-hmm. know, cattails, you know, willows, just thick stuff, you know, where it's boggy and people, man can't, you know, oaks can't grow to, you know, create an open you know, right. forest or, or man can't get in there and clear it out. So it's thicker there. But yeah, they, uh, that's the, the, you know, they either watch the back trail or that they think about it and they head to a specific location, the ones that live longer. But that's the only time they do that that I've seen is when they have, you know, they, they're able to live long enough to make those decisions. Mm-hmm. That's interesting to think about, a, <clears throat> let's just say a, a buck's mindset of like, once he gets out of that, like at some point of like initial flee the scene, at some point he starts to think like, I'm, I'm wounded. How do I get to somewhere, a known safety area? Well, that's what I think is interesting. Cause about, it definitely happens about like kind of that, that cone you described there. Um, chain in terms of like, you know, it, obviously the deer's going into this direction and I get as that cone gets wider. Have you seen any, I'm sure you're documenting things, but have you seen any patterns to, um, and I'm sure it varies based on the hit, but point of impact to like bedding for like a gut shot deer, like, you know, do, do you typically see a bed within X hundred yards? And if you haven't, then maybe it's like, Hey, this deer's not as, uh, has hit as we thought. Yeah. So, uh, if you watch my videos, I've mentioned it a few times where I tell the hunters, you know, especially on the gut shots, I said, we're likely to find your deer within 200 to 300 yards, somewhere in that range. And I've even had people call me, even like before tracking was legal in Minnesota, I was tracking in Wisconsin where it was legal. Yeah. I'd have guys in Minnesota call me and say, I know you can't track my deer, but I'd like to get your advice. I shot a deer, hit it in the gut. I know it was a gut shot. I uh, saw it run off, you know, about a hundred yards went around behind some trees. I said, where are you at now? Are you tracking? He said, no, I'm still in my stand. <laughs> Smart move by this guy. He called before, before he even got down. And I said, if I was you, I'd slip out of there, come in tomorrow morning. You're probably going to find your deer not far from where you last saw it. Well, there's a fence over there and it goes into the, you know, the neighbor's woods. I said, the deer probably didn't even cross the fence. It probably, as soon as you lost sight of it, got to the fence. It's feeling sick. It just laid down where it was at. And that's where you find it. And sure enough, the next morning he found it bedded right at the fence. And so if you gut shoot a deer and you don't want to bring a dog out or a dog's not available, and I'm going to say this outside the rut, if it's a buck, does typically do it no matter what time of the year, unless they're getting hounded by a buck. But uh, those factors always come to play a coyote yeah. bump or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But typically within two to 300 yards, they'll lay down wherever they're at, you know, or somewhere near where they stopped running, you know, the hunch up start typically like a gut shot though. They'll run a short distance, stop, look around. They kind of hunch up, walk away slowly. Within two or 300 yards, they bed down, and that's where you find them next morning. If you don't bump them or if coyotes don't bump them tonight, the night, another deer. Now, if you watched uh, you watch the hunting public at all, yep. yeah. um, so I, I went down there to try and help Ted find his deer because I knew the deer was dead, and, and even though I didn't have high hopes of my dog man track it, I figured we could help win search with it. Um. I told Ted that we'd probably find that deer within, you know, two or 300 yards of that spot. What they didn't show on, on the video is I also mentioned to Ted that these deer, well, I think they did mention where I, I said that these deer during the rut, these bucks are, will do things opposite of what you're typically used to seeing. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what happened to his buck. It ended up going another 800 yards from where, um, yeah, where he had first bedded, where they bumped it or whatever. Because they're back to run. Yeah, he's probably looking for a doe. You know, yeah. and um, and I know I saw one of the comments in the in that YouTube video where somebody said, "Oh, that's BS. That guy, that tracker doesn't know what he's talking about." <laughs> you don't read but, them, don't read them comments. They're not going to yeah, help you anyways. Yeah, I don't. I, I usually don't. But uh, anyway, I noticed that one. But <laughs> he doesn't track obviously and doesn't see the things i see i've i've tracked for guys that shot deer that were fall, you know bucks that were falling does and you know the this crazy story is like the doe ran off the buck ran off it was a good hit 15 minutes later here comes the buck walking back by trying to get back on the doe and he's got blood pouring out 100 percent. yeah and so you know a gut shot deer 
even though they may feel a little sick or whatever, he don't care. You know, it's not like it's going through their lungs and they're they're gasping for air. Yeah. Other than feeling a little sick, he still has those hormones going. He wants to breathe. You know. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, Jared brought up this deer. Um, I'm bringing it out here for a second. So this is a this is a mountain buck here in Pennsylvania. That deer was probably, I don't know, seven eight years old when I killed him. And yeah. I mean, just a horse of a deer, you know, just, just massive. And, and so I'd rattled this, uh, this buck was hitting a scrape. I snort wheezed him in to the base of the tree. In fact, too close, right? I did a, uh, uh, you know, hanging hunt and I shot him pretty much right underneath me at that steep angle. And basically uh, again, initially thought like dead deer. Right. And I got, I didn't get a complete pass through, but I got through the other side in the air, like fletchings just hanging out. Um, but what happened was it was so steep. I basically just crushed the close lung and missed the far lung. Right. And yeah. so this deer runs, stops at 30 yards, you know, and then kind of flaps its tail and tries, it almost looked like he was about to do a death run. Right. Waited plenty of time, took my time, got out, walked over to where he stopped. And I mean, I'm just talking like blood everywhere, you know, just bleeding like crazy. By that time, it's an hour later. Like I'm confident, start following the trail good blood, good blood, good blood, starts petering, starts petering. And at this point, it's like, all right, like I'm stopping. I'm in like a bunch of mountain laurel and rhododendron. It's thick as hell. Back out. Um, what was it? Three of us, four of us, four of us come in the next day. And it's like, all right, let's go. And and I left my bow at the last spot, which I didn't know if I could actually find again. It, it was a work. <laughs> it was a work day. And Jeremy's like, no work today. We're, we're finding we're, this we're, buck. We're blood trail. <laughs> yeah, we're finding this buck. And so get, get on you. Get on you. Yeah. So we get we get in there and, you know, um, we start going and find a little bit of blood here, a little blood there. And then like, again, starts petering out. And again, it's, you know, I feel like we kind of probably did some like mini grids to where it was like, oh, cool. We're back oh, yeah, on the trail. We, we had four people, which after an hour or two started borderline doing our own tracking. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go see down this trail. Mm -hmm. And know? meanwhile, I'm kind of in that same mindset you are, Shane, where I'm looking, I'm like, all right, there's two ways this guy's going to go. I'll go down this way, back up, and then I'll come down this way. And at one point, there's this a little like mountain spring that comes down. And I'm talking, it's not even as wide as this table, half as wide as this table. And that son of a gun walked right down that mountain spring into where there was leaves on rocks in the middle of the creek with blood drops on it. And that's what I was following. And he goes down, he crosses a bigger creek. He comes back across that big creek. He goes up on the top of the hill. And it was two miles. I mean, we tracked the whole thing. And I remember walking up and I'm like, man, like, we got to be close. Like, got to be close. And I took one step and looked, and that damn deer's laying there, bedded down, looking at me. And so right. I had to knock another arrow, and I basically missed him. And somehow I must have gave him enough of a heart attack that he went 100 yards, fell over dead. <laughs> you know, but yeah. it's one of those things that, like, it, as much blood as I found, like, and I mean, I found a lot over the course of two miles. Like, that deer was still alive in his bed enough that he could get up and escape me one more time before he finally just, you know, gave it in. What what you just explained at the end is something i've heard numerous times and uh and it's your your tracking your shot and tracking are all typical of a lung one lung hit deer yep uh, um that deer could have very possibly survived you know had it had you not jumped mm -hmm. and, um you know they can they can supply enough oxygen with one blood or with enough oxygen to the blood with one lung one blood. Mm -hmm. to to move around and do things but as soon as they start running that one lung can't supply enough oxygen. Yep. And what he did is <clears throat> he was probably already low on oxygen levels in his body. When you jump him up and he had to exert force and use his lungs and his heart pumping, it, it, it just, he couldn't do it anymore. And, and there he expired. I had a buddy that happened to uh, last fall, I think. They had tracked this deer and thought it was one lung hit deer. They finally came up on it, still alive. They jumped it. The deer ran 50 yards and fell over. I know. that it, it, shocked, it blew me away because, like, at first I was like, oh, I shot him again. Like, he's dead. And then I found my arrow, and I'm like, there's no blood on this. Like, where did I hit? You know, by the time we I, watched him I, expire, I had already grid searched the whole rest of the property. It's about a thousand acres. <laughs> yeah, and we. Come I was back, off blood. I was just looking for. A deer. We go down, and I'd I'd hit him in the hoof basically because when he jumped up, I I just pulled the shot or something, and it was through a whole mess of thick. But anyways, like his one lung literally was hanging outside of his body, right? And he had essentially, yeah, he just overexerted himself till he just died. Like it wasn't because of my follow up shot. He just died. Yeah, and that's that's why I like pass-throughs, and and because we we've tracked a lot of one lung hit deer, 
Yeah. You know, and the, always the hunter always says, yeah, I shot him. My, my arrow didn't pass through. I think it stopped in the off shoulder. No, it didn't. Um, mm -mm. <laughs> it didn't even make it past the first lung. And, and our recovery rate for one lung hit deer is really low. Oh, I can't um, even imagine, man. Yeah. And so, I mean, even though the deer, the deer may end up dying and going much farther. Um, I, I'm sure there's trackers, like I said before, that have dogs that are capable but without blood to confirm, maybe just a speck of blood to confirm we're still on this track. You know, after a certain period of time, three quarters of a mile, a mile, I have to pull Callie off. There's no sign of the deer. She's not really acting like she's tracking the deer. And so, you know, the deer, you know, survived or went on someone else's property. And that's the thing, you know, I said, I like pass for that reason. And I see these guys on TV or YouTube videos or whatever shooting, uh, not to pick on rage, but big mechanicals. Mm -hmm. And you see them go... And their deer are falling over dead or, or they're, they're always recovering them. And I'm like, what's going on behind the scenes? Because I track so many deer that sure. are one lung deer, limited penetration. These guys at some point got to have to be uh, having issues at finding deer. Are they bringing dogs in there and not showing the viewers or are they doing grid searches and not showing the viewers? I, I think that's part of it, but that's aside from the, the oh, I, I get it, man. Me personally, I want to, I want to get a pass through. I want to hit both lungs. I don't want to want one lung deer out there trying to track it because they will go forever. Yeah. I mean, leg hits and stuff aside, you know, I would take a liver hit over a one lung all day long. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take liver or gut because those, those are a hundred percent fatal and knowing what I know, you know, I like my daughter shot one during the youth hunt, um, a couple a few years back, she shot it with like a two forty three or two twenty three or something. And at first I thought it was a good hit. Thank God I had video of it because I went back and played in slow motion. And what I thought was like the, the impact hitting here, it was actually back here. And I, and I told my daughter, I said, we're not even going to track this year. We're going to back out. And I brought Callie there the next morning. She took me right to it, hmm. you know, um, because I know what a deer is going to do after a good shot. I know they're always going to die. They're not going to go probably 200 yards. It made it an easy decision. Now, I, f I feel bad because the deer is going to live longer and maybe, you know, be in some discomfort. I don't know if they necessarily suffer. I mean, sure. I don't know what they're actually feeling. Yeah. We don't know. I don't, I don't like the idea that they're in pain or whatever, but you can't always control that. But, but like you said, I would, a deer that's one long hit is obviously going to feel some pain too, especially yes. if you broke a rib yep. and they're going to live a long time and then you may never recover. Yep. So yeah. I'd much rather have it, like you said, a, a liver or gut shot. One thing that, yeah, uh, have a one, lung. <laughs> mm -hmm. one, that. one thing I've seen Shane that, uh, I'm just curious your opinion on is it, it seems like because, um, you know, there's, there's like ego, I think tied up in, in deer hunting and like, you know, we, we want to, we want to make a good shot and we want to, um, you know, you just want to be as effective at it as possible. It seems like, and I'm definitely guilty of it. So I'm not excluding myself from this. It seems like, guys are so willing to like lie to themselves about what they saw or the, you know, their, their perception of things. Uh, and also to like make decisions. Uh, it just seems so fueled by like, you know, the ego that comes along with hunting and like the, their excitement from the experience and yeah. like they're, they're wanting to like get their hands on it. There's animal. no way I made a bad yeah, shot. They're willing to say like, ah, you know, even though in their heads, like, I don't really know where I hit that deer. Like it was a good deer, you know, it was a big buck, you know, he definitely did the right thing. And like, I've got some blood here, uh, you know, we're going to track him. They're just so willing to throw out the idea of like, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't as good a shot as I thought, or maybe, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I've had the opposite where guys make a great shot and they yeah, yeah. talk themselves right out of it. <laughs> yeah. and say, oh, it's a bad shot. I had a guy call me one time, wanted me to track a, a nice bucky shot. And I got there and, and um, he was explaining it to me, he had a lighted knock. And he's like, man, I just don't, I'm not sure about the shot. I saw the arrow flipping and stuff. And, and I don't know if it hit a limb or something. I said, where, when you first shot, where do you think you hit the deer? Oh, I thought it was a perfect shot. But I got to thinking about it. And then I saw that knock. And I was like, we're going to go off where you thought initially where you hit the deer. I said, your deer's probably dead. Put cattle on the track. 100 yards, there was the deer. Perfect mm -hmm. shot. Mm -hmm. he had taught himself right out of a perfect yeah. shot and 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 because he saw after the arrow passed through Salt bounced kick. around yeah lighted up. that's funny and um well no big deal he got it you got got me up there and tracked it and i only charged him like 40 bucks so it wasn't like a whole lot of money out of his pocket but you know he I, I think part of the reason was it was a big buck 
And, sure. and that well, a lot of times those guys really get nervous. Like, did I make a good shot? It, it has the opposite effect. Yeah. Whereas, um, when I think a lot of guys, if they shoot something like a doe and a lot, most people are fairly calm shooting at a doe versus a big, you know, huge buck. And those guys are usually too confident in their shot. They mm. shoot a doe and yeah. like, Oh, it was a great shot. Let's go find it. And then they jump the doe up and, you know, so it can have the effect both ways, I think. Yeah. Shane, one of the things I want to kind of wrap this podcast up with is talking about um, the use of dogs in trailing deer. And obviously, you know, I know you're you're really fixated in the Minnesota and Wisconsin area. And you, you talked, obviously, about, you know, it wasn't legal for a while there in Minnesota. There are still several states that it isn't legal to use a dog in, correct? Yeah, very few. And I think those are more the uh, states out west, like California and Oregon or something like that. And what, uh, I think there's, and there's one in the extreme Northeast, I think. Okay. I and, think most states allow it now. And is it mainly like varies by state, but regulation is like, I have to have, you know, Cali on a lead versus she can be free reign and, you know, type of thing. Yeah. It's um, basically in the South, the Southeast where you can track off lead, mm -hmm. um, you know, hunting with dog, hunting deer with dogs is legal in some of those states, like my home state of South Carolina, it's yep. legal. Yep. You know, basically, you basically hunt them like rabbits. You know, you let the dogs go, they run them back by you and shoot them up here. Um, that was one of the struggles of getting it legalized here in Minnesota is because, you know, you got a lot of these hunters that don't know anything um, or not in no fault of their own. They just um, are ignorant to what tracking with the dog is all about. Sure. And not ignorant in a bad way. It's just they don't know about it. Mm -hmm. And um, and the fight with them was they were like, oh, if we legalize this, people are going to be, you know, hunting deer with dogs and say they're tracking a wounded deer. And it was so hard for them. Just take a minute and read what we're yeah. trying to legalize. The deer, the dog's going to be on a leash. You know. Yeah. You know, we're not even trying to fight for it to be off leash tracking, which would be real nice. The recovery rates a little higher with those. Um. But, you know, they, you're trying to get it through their you know, heads. Like, look, this is going to be on leash and the dogs aren't going to be running the deer. I can't run that fast. I'd have to, you know, I'd be breaking the law. We don't need to be worried about lawbreakers when we make rules and regulation. That's the problem. Yep. It's like every time there's a rule, oh, somebody's going to take advantage of it. Well, they're going to take advantage of it, whether you legalize it or not. 100%. If a guy wants to hunt with a dog up here, they're going to hunt with a dog, whether it's tracking is legal or not. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes it. Oh so, yeah. And, and in the Southern States and, and States where it's legal to track off lead, they throw a GPS call around the dog. They put the dog, same process we do. They train, I imagine they train them very similarly. Um, they just put them at the hit site and let the dog go. And then they sit at the truck. I, um, what was it? One of the real tree shows, uh, um, or something like that. Uh, my, I think what's the guy that makes the jokes on real tree, not like a while the other guy, the bigger oh. guy with the little mustache. Yeah. Oh, Pots. yes. Pots? Yeah. No. That, that's him. Yeah. That's him. Not Stan. So he, no. Not Stan Potts, the other guy. Yeah. 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 Anyway, he shot Michael, they brought Michael a Potts. Yeah. Yeah. They, they brought a dog there and they hung out in the truck while the dog was off and they looked at the GPS and said, All right, the dogs stop moving. He's in one spot. He must be on your deer. And they walk over there as a deer. Wow. So um, that makes it easier for the tracker. So I, I would love to be able to. Yeah. Some of these, you know, you wouldn't be ass. nearly as in good a shape though. If you just got to sit yeah. in your truck and let Callie go if do you the look work. look at my arms during tracking season. It looks like I say it self mutilating <laughs> myself. Just, I came back, uh, with, when looking for Ted's deer down in Iowa, I came back and there was blood pouring off of me and he's like, my God, boy, you didn't cut yourself all up. Oh, it's just, you it's just, superficial stuff. It'll heal. But, um, it's crazy it's nice. that. I mean, when you think about it as hunters, like we owe those deer the responsibility of doing everything within our power to find, you know, and recover. And so the opposition to it just seems so obscure to me because it's like, well, I, I get like, oh, they're going to break the law and stuff. But like, ultimately, it's like, don't you w at least want that option to like do everything you can to find that deer? Seems yeah. crazy. Well, it seems like it's it's legal and. Most, but he's getting there. And is there organizations <clears throat> right now, Shane, that like, so basically like Jared and I hunt Ohio and Pennsylvania. Like how do we find a tracker that's near us to, to do it? If I can't, if I can kind of plug, I have a similar question. Yeah. I was going to say that like, dude, one of the reasons that I end up, and I would assume you end up um, gritting is just like, we know a dog would be, would be better, but we don't know. Yeah. yeah. I don't know who. It's like, it's like, do I 
try to just make some calls and try to figure out someone with a dog that like I don't really know their level of expertise or do I just start grading? And it just seems easier in a lot of ways. You're like, ah, if I start grading, I'll probably. But if, if we had somebody in our back pocket or knew of somebody we could recommend to say, here's here's how I would go about finding someone with a dog, I'll bet that people would be inclined to, to take us up on that. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll start off by saying I know the frustrating, uh, I know the frustrations or the dilemma of when to get a tracker. Because even as a tracker, I still make mistakes tracking my own deer. I'm, I don't want to give up on it. Like when we were in North Dakota, we were tracking that deer that I shot. And we kept thinking liver, uh, at least one long liver. I should have backed out immediately at that point. But I was we were finding blood. The deer had bedded down in front of me in the field. And then it went into the woods. I knew it was like really hurt. It was probably dead. We ended up finding that deer still alive. Mm-hmm. And so I, and I, and I, afterwards I'm like, Shane, you're a tracker. You knew better. Why did you keep tracking it? You know? So I know the dilemma that hunters go through, you know, that don't have it. I have my own tracking dog and I still make these screw up and make these mistakes. But, um, you know, the first thing I would do is, is find your local tracker before the season and know who they are and, and do a little research on, because there are trackers out there that will scam you. I mean, or I wouldn't call them trackers, just like there's hunters that poach. They're not hunters, mm-hmm. but there are people out there. Anytime money's involved, they will look at it as a way to make easy money. We had an instance up here where someone was, uh, well, someone would post on Facebook, they needed a tracker. And this person would say, Oh, I'm in, I'm in the area. And then would charge them hundreds and hundreds of dollars to bring a, a dog that wasn't trained out there. And say, oh, <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, dude, people will get desperate for dogs. I've had people ask <clears throat> me to bring my Brittany Spaniels out that I trained to find shed antlers to like find their deer. And I'm like, I, I don't think it works that way. <laughs> and they're like, well, just bring them out. I'm like, uh, okay, but like, they're not going to find your deer. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, a dog is better than no dog. <clears throat> no. Yeah. But like I said, as a last resort, this will be just like grid search. As a last resort, if you can't get a trained dog there, you know, experienced tracker or trained dog, you know, take a dog out there, a lab or something, you know, and they have, you know, they have a better chance of finding it than no dog. At all. Sure. Yeah. You know, we've, we've had instances where we told somebody is like, do you, you know, they say like my neighbor has a dog they use for hunting and okay, well give it a shot. Cause there's no trackers available. You know, it's yeah. the middle of the rut. But what do you have to lose? You know? They're not going to hurt anything sure. and then go out there and grid search. But um, back to your other question, uh, uh, who, where would you find a tracker? Start with unitedbloodtrackers.org. I was going to say, dot that's the one I have heard of, at least in the past, was United Blood Trackers. And does it show you by like yeah. region? Mm-hmm. Why don't you pull that yeah, up? So you, yeah, United so you can click on the, So it has it broke down on map. You can either type in your zip code and it shows all the trackers. I'm going to have Colton and, pull it up while we're talking here. Let's, I want to see yeah. who's in some of our regions. Was that fairly vetted by those guys, Shane? No. So anybody can join the UBT. You have to pay a yearly membership fee. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a business for fee, you, right? Yeah. What's that? It's it's a business for you guys. So I mean, you know, you're looking. Well, probably. I do it as a pastime, but um, yeah, um, as, uh, I, I enjoy it doing it like I do deer hunting. I mean, I. Like I said, I don't charge Jump anything. To our part to track. of Ohio. If somebody wants to give me a few bucks for gas or whatever, that's fine. Yep. A lot of times they track, they tip a little bit better because they're happy with finding their deer. But sure, um, it's to me, it's like deer hunting. When you go out there and you shoot a deer, or you go out there and and you don't shoot a deer, or you shoot a deer and you can't find it. When I go out there to track someone else's deer, if, if I think it's dead and we can't find it, I'm pretty bummed when I'm on my drive home. Yeah, I bet. If you go out there and recover a deer like that big buck, thirty-three hour old track. I don't know if I, if he was as more excited than I was. Even though <laughs> I didn't, probably didn't show it. Yeah, I, you talking about somebody was really pumped on the inside on the whole way home. So it's still that roller coaster for me, and it's and so yeah, we make a few bucks in tips um, to cover our fuel expense stuff. But there are some guys that do it for a business. But uh, it's your pastime. Four, That's three. why you're yeah, doing to it. Me, it's, to me, it's a, just a, something Nine, I four, started five. doing to help people out. And it's uh, I, it's grown to take up more of my time than uh, I initially thought it would. Yep. But, um, yeah, so unitedbloodtrackers.org or unitedbloodtrackers.com. You want me to wait for him to bring it up? Yeah, what do you got? So what's, what's the name? <clears throat> unitedbloodtrackers.org or .com. Either one takes you to the same spot. He's reading off some names of like our part, the part of Ohio that I'm in there. 
I was just curious because because I know a lady who brings up the the small like wire haired dogs, yeah. and but I don't know how well she's like known or if she's like a part of the organization. Her name's Martha Jewell, and I know she breeds them dogs. She's a lady that taught me to trap. I mean, she's a so basically she, you you know, it's a great resource to have, but there isn't necessarily there, a there vetting. Are, there process. are ways there are ways to vet them yourself. And, gotcha. And, and so. <laughs> First of all, I'll tell you how to find a track. UnitedBloodTracks.com or .org. Mm -hmm. There's a spot where you can type in your zip code, and it shows all the trackers in order of distance. So the closest one may be three miles, and the next one may be 20 cool. miles, and so you can look at that. Um, or you can click on your state, and it'll show all the trackers that service your state. There may be some just across the border in Wisconsin, like in my area, that will come over to across the border. Um, jot those numbers down. Call a few of them and explain to them where you're at. But most trackers have social media these, these days mm -hmm. and i know that ubt does have testing so if you look at their profile on the ubt website you can see that their ub their dog has passed ubt1 ubt2 got it and those are uh, those tests are more uh involved or more complicated so the higher the testing number a dog has passed that dog has got some great skills got it ubt1 is the basic ability to, to trail a deer um two or three hundred yards a couple of 90s you know with a little bit of blood yeah i could pass that yeah so <laughs> yeah you could get ubt one uh, i'm ubt one certified yeah yeah so um so there is that certification to show that dog has the ability to trail deer and, and the higher but most people like i said have social media yep what i tell a lot of people is you know go to their Facebook page. A lot of trackers like have a tracking page specifically for their dog, or whatever. Um, look at their recovery photos. You know, they should have, if they have a dog that's worth anything, they should have a lot. If they've been doing it for at least an entire season or, or two seasons, they should have some recovery photos. Mm -hmm. If you go to someone that has a dog and they have one or two pictures of them with a deer and no, no hunter in the picture or no dog in the picture, the odds are they either the dog is new and they they found their own deer or something like that you know so it, they may it doesn't mean they're a bad person their dog's not trained it's just if you're worried about getting someone especially if they only have one or two pictures of recovery and they're charging you two hundred dollars if my thought is if, if if a tracker's charging you two three four hundred dollars to come out and recover your deer they better have 20 or 40 or 50 recovery pictures minimum you know right. they better show me that they have um, a lot of re uh, recoveries. If someone out there has a dog that doesn't have much recoveries, most of those trackers don't charge anything. Take you know twenty five dollars for fuel. They want to get their dog some experience. Yeah, they're, they're usually, training. Yeah, they're usually upfront about that. Look, my dog only has. You know, I've only trained it. It's only been on one real track, and we recovered it. So, yeah. just want to let yeah. you know that ahead of time. Cool. Um, so, yeah. Well, I mean, if, well, if we hit a big buck, like I want like a Shane Simpson level, like, dog. <laughs> like I, yeah, I don't want to just be like, Oh, you have a dog. Like, yeah, me too. That's why it's an important resource for us to kind of vet out. And like, uh, you know, frankly, I, I would feel much better if I knew the guy in our area. Well, I think Shane made a good point of like, you know, look at United blood trackers yeah. preseason, talk to these guys, get to know them. And you probably have one in your back pocket yeah. as you enter the season. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. So, it's not that hard to find them. And, 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 and with a little bit of research, you can figure out whether they're legit or not. Yeah. Um, and usually we don't get any phonies on the United Blood Trackers. They, they're not going to, if they're trying to cheat people out of money, they're not going to spend the money to be a member of it. Yeah, a, that makes sense. Know. I was going to ask Shane, or, I know you helped uh, Ted recover that buck. <clears throat> Have you, would you say you've been on any other, like, would you call them high profile uh, blood trails, like, pe like people we might know or? No, not that I haven't been for any famous people. Okay. Ted's probably the most famous. Oh, famous. <laughs> there was one that came to mind earlier. We we're talking about liver hits. You know that guy, uh, Ty Easley? He's with Heartland Bow Hunter. Yeah. He's from Kansas. He's yeah. got some giants. Oh, yeah. He made a post about a shot, his daughter shot or something. Okay. Was it, no, it wasn't him. No, it was like someone else. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I'm I haven't. Thinking I, one, I'm thinking one of the jury, jury people. Yeah, I saw that okay. one. I haven't seen him real recently, but I know Ty shot a, just a freak. Um, a couple of years ago and he hit it back in the liver <clears throat> and I remember just watching kind of that episode unfold and, and he found that deer more than 24 hours uh, you know later still alive like they bumped him out of a bed and um, I, I think they ended up I, he probably had another put another arrow in him it, it was like 36 hours after wow. the, the initial hit of a, of a liver hit 
Well, that one that Ward but, killed on the ground a couple, maybe last year in mm-hmm. Iowa, that real big one, he wasn't sure about that hit and penetration. And I, I he may have even called you, Shane, but he, he had called several and like could everybody was busy or couldn't make it in terms of travel and stuff. You know, and I, I think he ended up calling uh, a lady that, that did the track, and it was like, 40 yards it was like yeah there should be it's dead well and dude at the same time like Corey, my good buddy Mm -hmm. that buck he shot last year was straight like broadside liver and and he ran like 60 yards and fell over dead yeah Yeah, that 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 uh aaron did call me uh, about that deer and i don't like frontal shots uh myself because because you because of the way the rib cage is shaped right there and uh, as a tracker, I'm not always right about my assessment of a shot or whatever. On that, I think Jake, had, he had one he'd shot like yep. a few weeks earlier, and they yep. didn't find it. Yep. And and I talked to Jake about that, too. I told Jake that was a dead deer. I thought it was dead, you know. Um, they never recovered or never found that deer, and they, they surmised that maybe it wasn't a lethal hit. Mm-hmm. But of course, I had to look at, uh, you know, it wasn't the greatest – footage to right it was that one like up over the edge and stuff yeah. tails or something yep um and then when i saw aaron's hit and obviously they don't uh, you know trying to send stuff and communicate over text you don't always get the high definition yep. stuff and i told him i said man i don't know about that shot unless you got an artery or hit the heart or something i don't like the looks of that yep. and I, it must have been Zach when he hit an artery or something because the deer just ran and, you know. Yeah, it was dead in 60 I tell, yards. I tell a lot of guys, they, you know, when they call me to track or a, ask advice, they're like, oh, I hit it here. And I'm like, well, there's nothing there but arteries. So either you hit an artery and the deer's, you know, less than 100 yards away and you should have a damn good blood trail to follow or the deer's not going to die. You know, mm-hmm. those, those are pretty easy to figure out. I think with them, I know I've seen, again, I shouldn't be reading the comments. I've seen on social media or in those youtube videos where they're uh, they're giving the thp guys a little grief about they've used dogs on several tracks lately sure. um i i actually think they're doing the right thing you know they had that track uh years ago with the hushing crew yep where they had a dog and i think that was their first experience with a dog and plus i'm friends with them so i you know we talk a lot and they see my tracks from, from my videos and anytime i track for someone you know, I I usually get repeat calls from them, even when they don't actually need me because they don't want to screw up. They've learned that, a, you know, they can screw up a scent trail. Yeah. They're playing it safe. They know how uh, effective a dog is. You know, I've taken Cali and we can start to recovery was a minute, you know, less than 60 seconds. And where a hunter would have spent you know, a few hours taking that same course. So they're very effective at finding deer. And I think that's what those guys are doing. They've had experience with it. Um, even though they, they, they make lethal shots, not everyone makes a lethal shot like Jake's. They didn't find that deer, but I think that's, what's gotten into them. They like, okay, it's made them a little, little, uh, step back and think a little bit more about what our next step is in tracking instead of like everyone else. So basically what I'm saying is people I've tracked for them that had experience with a tracking dog and seen it in action are much more apt to call a dog the next time, even if they don't necessarily yeah. eat one. They're just playing it safe a lot of time. Well, dude, that's what I was saying is like the natural inclination for somebody who doesn't have a dog in their back pocket is like, okay, initial impact, blood to a certain point, panic, grid, and either blood, yeah, back out or grid, you mm-hmm. know, especially if you get rain. Like that's the biggest one for me where I know that it's like, okay, rain's coming, we have blood. Let's see what we got until it rains. And then once it rains, it's like we, we made it so far or we didn't. The only thing you're left with is is to grid. And so the next day you go out and just grid and it's like. Yeah, which is needle in the haystack most of the time. 50, yeah, it's 50-50. Yeah. You know, but if you had a dog that you're like, hey, we don't have to push it. We don't have to stress about this rain. We think it's a decent hit. Let's just back out. You'll call a dog and, and go into and, the morning. And call it, a, call it a tracker sooner rather than later. Yeah. Um, even if you're not committed to using a dog yet, like say you just shot the deer and you're still in your stand and you know it's an iffy hit, go ahead and call that tracker or text and say, hey, I may need you. What's your availability? I don't know yet. I haven't looked at my arrow, but just I'm just checking to see your availability. Sure. Yep. Because, you know, we get busy or like I'll give you a typical day for me on the weekend. I work a 12 hour shift. I get home at 6 p.m. Um, it's starting to get dark. 
um, I get a few calls, you know, Hey Shane, you available to track in the morning. I shot one this evening. I'm not so sure about it. I think it was a good hit, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Then you get a call at either a text at 11 PM <laughs> or you get one at 8 AM the next morning. Those guys have already been tracking. They spent extra hours. They basically, they should have had my ear on it early on, but they decided, okay, I'll wait some morning. I'll look again. Then I'll call dog. You know what? Well, I'm already booked. Yeah. Had you called me right when you knew there was an issue. Yeah. Now I was available at 6 PM or 7 PM. And so basically even if whenever you know that there's it's a questionable hit or maybe uh, a struggle to find this deer, go ahead and get their ears on it sooner than rather than later. Yep. And I, I'll be honest, if you call a tracker, you know, if you shoot it, we see, we follow these social media groups and stuff and we have our own. If we see a post, somebody shot a deer and like, Oh, what do you think about this blood? You know, a picture of an arrow. And then, and then they convince the guy to, to back out until morning, to try to get a dog. Well, I'll take a peek in the morning and then I'll, I'll, if it doesn't look right, I'll call a dog. Well, we start getting, you know, on our, we have a message board, private message board among the trackers in our network in Minnesota. And we'll start getting texts. Hey, and the messages, this guy is now looking for a dog. And I'll look at the time and it's 11 p.m., 11 a.m. That tells me right away that he not only waited overnight, he's been searching all morning. And now, just now, trackers don't want to go after a track like that. They know yeah. you grid search. Yeah. It's usually a last resort. I mean, usually guys don't think about it until the very, they've already, they for sure I've graded search. the whole property yeah. and they're like, oh, maybe, maybe a dog. <laughs> I know. And it needs to be the other way around. Yeah. You know, and it's hey, just. Think, yeah. Think how quick a dog works and how quickly they find it. I, you're going to spend hours out there needle, you know, looking on your hands and knees for next speck of blood or even grid searching takes a couple hours. Yeah, easily. At yeah, easily. Yeah. A dog, you get a dog in there and you find it in 15 minutes or 30 minutes usually. And, and so now even if there's temperatures warming into the, I want to find my deer as soon as possible so I can start cutting it up and getting it in the freezer. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, that should be enough to convince you to call a dog sooner rather than later. Uh, what should somebody expect to pay for a track job? Yeah, that's the, that's the number one question we get. Um, it depends on that person and if they're doing it as a business or not. Um, okay. There's some people that, like I got a buddy up here. He does landscaping in the summer. Um, he, uh, and he does tracking in the fall and winter. He treats it as a business. Most, I should, yeah, I can confidently say that most trackers, especially up here, um, do it as kind of a, thing a hobby or something to help you out i know one tracker that will not take a dime from anyone even if you try to tip him he does it simply to help out yeah he refuses to take a dime but uh, most trackers either charge or take tips and charge nothing okay or they have a small flat fee like 40 or 50 60 bucks and take tips on that and then there's there are a few out there that you know charge a a fee of you know hundred dollars to come out hundred dollars if we recover but in general, I can't speak for the entire country, but I know here in Wisconsin, Minnesota in general, you can expect to pay 50 to a hundred dollars. If you have to pay anything at all, it's totally up to you. Usually tips are what's accepted. And, and that's kind of the going rate 50 to a hundred bucks. Yeah, well worth it. <laughs> Including the tip you think? Yeah. I mean, like someone, if I show up at most of us travel within an hour or two, you know, not much farther than that. <clears throat> yep. If someone gave me a you know, $50 bill, I'm happy with that. I can't speak for the others, but I, I can, I think it would be safe to say if you gave someone a hundred dollar bill, that's, that would more than satisfy them. because we're, we're doing it, um, for the enjoyment, you know, we're doing it also to try and help out. Mm -hmm. So that hundred dollars is like a nice little bonus. That well, we yeah. Get. And as the hunter, I mean, we, I want you to pick up the next time I text you. <laughs> yeah. So no, I want to make sure exactly. it's adequate. Yeah. No yeah you put a hundred dollars in my hand. And next time you, I see a text from me, I'm calling you first. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, we treat it I mean, like a hobby or a pastime, but also to help. So imagine you going bow hunting for yourself, and then when you got done bow hunting, there's a hundred dollars laid on your truck each time. Um, with, you'd love bow hunting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially if I get to go bow, bow hunt somebody else's property, <laughs> and then I get back to a hundred dollars of my. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Very cool, man. Well, Shane, where um I, we talked about a little bit. So Shane Simpson Outdoors on YouTube and on Facebook um shane, for shane simpson hunting simpson saying yeah okay shane simpson hunting if if, if people yeah. are going to get a hold of you for a, a blood tracking job what's the best way to do it uh if you go to minnesota tracking dogs on facebook okay. um 
we have a list of all the trackers in Minnesota mm -hmm. and uh, you can see which county each of us is in. Or United Blood Trackers, you can type in, you know, if you want to find me in Minnesota. I mean, if you're not in Minnesota, don't bother. Sure. I, well, I shouldn't say that. I went to Iowa. I go to, <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you're in Pennsylvania, don't call me to track your deer. Yeah, it's uh, only like a 14 hour drive, Shane. I don't get it. I got $100 yeah. here for you. Got 100 bones in it for you. Yeah, I've been offered big money to travel quite a ways, but I, I don't ex usually accept it because I'm not in it for that. If I decide I'm going to come help you, I'm going to do it just because I want to come help you. And, you know, if you cover my fuel, fine. But um, yeah, I, you know, if you text me or message me for advice, if you shot one, I don't mind those. Just know that I can't respond to every single one. Yep. Yeah. Like this past Makes year, I, I thought I had a hundred messages from out of staters just saw my YouTube videos and wanted my advice. Yep. Don't call me, call your local tracker or text me. I'm not, I'm not the only tracker in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it's cool that you, I, kinda... I don't mind helping. It's just, I don't have a time to help yeah, everyone. That yeah. makes sense. So, well, it, uh, you know, I know that like the, the videos that you've done with Cali, are, are you going to continue to do those series with Cali moving forward? Yeah. Was, uh, I, last year I quit early because she had some behavioral issues. I think um, it was because she was coming into heat mm -hmm. in that same period every year. That's what, some of the other trackers suggested that um, that was the issue. So I had her spayed over the summer. This year she tracked probably her best season yet wow. um, as far as her her behavior out in the field and her recovery rate. So, yeah, as long as she keeps behaving well, I'm going to keep tracking with her. Cool, because I think those are a huge resource for all of us. Like, and I think what's so cool about this podcast is, like, you know, frankly, I kind of went into it like, oh, let's understand how the – you know, the tracking with dogs works, but also come out of it of like, even if you don't use a dog, there's a lot of things that you have learned from that trail that can be applied to people just following a blood trail in general. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's awesome. Well, it's, it's given me this, uh, I think a better default than to start gridding. Like I, I've always been yeah. one and I've, I've learned as I've gotten older, but I've always been one to like, uh, you know, if blood's getting sparse, I'm like, I'm just gonna walk this trail out. You know, I'm just gonna, let me just see if he's like over here. And so I find, I find myself getting ahead of myself qu quite a bit. Um, also I just struggle to see blood for whatever reason. My dad is like so good at it, but so I find myself having to come, come back and like stick on the blood, stay on the blood. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think now before jumping into, um, well, even the season, but definitely before jumping into, uh, any type of a grid is I want to know. I want to know what kind of uh, assistance I can get from a dog in my area. Yep. Um, and have that as a default before doing any kind of gritting. I agree. Cool, man. Yep. Well, listen, Shane, we appreciate you coming on the Hunter podcast, man. Really interesting stuff. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will check out the, the videos with you and Callie here to kind of see some of these real world tracking examples and stuff. I've watched a few of them and, and they're super cool, man. I, I think the way that you kind of chronicle the actual track and, and everything is uh, again, if even if you weren't following a dog, just understanding the behavior of some of these deer is like super critical. I was telling Jeremy before we got on, I've I've never met a bad guy that loves dogs, so <laughs> we, we we knew you were gonna be all right before you got on. That's good. <laughs> appreciate it. So. Well, awesome, man. Well, we appreciate your time, and uh, we'll definitely make sure that we we get you back on here at some point. And if if you if you need turkey help in Ohio or Pennsylvania, we've we got spots for we've you. We got plenty. <laughs> Yeah, it's an open invite yeah. to come turkey hunt. We've got some places. Oh, cool. I'll, I'll keep that in mind. I'm, I'm editing turkey videos at the moment. Well, not at the moment, but um, I'm ed I'm currently editing videos this week and for the next few weeks to get them out from last spring. Okay. Well, yeah, so, if you're up this way, just shoot us a text and, you know, yeah. you need a spot to go. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I'm doing. I'm planning my turkey trips now. I don't know if I'll get out. Pennsylvania, I had actually had tags for Pennsylvania last year, but uh -huh. it came up and I couldn't make it out. So, um uh -huh. Who knows? I may get out there this year. Well, we're close. We're close to like West Virginia and Ohio. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not far. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. Awesome, man. Well, we appreciate it, Shane. I'll, I'll some pins. <laughs> yeah. All right, brother. All right, man. Have a good one. Right, Thank Shane. you, sir. See you, dude. Cool. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, you know, we talk about the, the kind of misconceptions around all deer hunting and, you know, uh, especially when we think about bow hunting, like the fact is like that, that hunt isn't over the moment you release that arrow. There's a lot of things that can go wrong after that. And uh, just to like kind of debunk some of these blood trailing myths and understand, you know, a guy who has been on how many trails of deer that 
you know, didn't die within sight, you know, what did they do? What was the behavior? Like that, that's invaluable information and knowledge to just understand like, oh, like this is real world scenarios of what these deer did. And he eventually finds them dead versus how we approach it, you know, guilty of lost blood, grid search, lost blood, grid search. Like that's not the way to do it. Yeah, I think it, it's a lot of it is common sense. <clears throat> it just comes down to um, to experience, I think. Well, I think you also get, you know, and I'll put myself in it. I get real emotional during that time. Oh, like yeah. when well, I'm trailing and I'm excited and, and you know, I'm at an all-time high of like, you know, I got to find this deer, I got to find this deer. Like you get wrapped up into it and you, you pull yourself through to situations that frankly make it worse. Um, you know, but that's the nature of deer hunting. Well, and it, I think it's when you get lucky with those that it just skews your perception of like, oh, well, you know, cause if you're thinking, well, the last two times that I ran out of blood, I just walked over the next ridge and, and right sure there. enough, there he was by water. You know, that's, that is, uh, it's just by chance that that, yeah. that happened. I, that happens so many times that, you know, the more people we talk to, you know, I think especially, it seems like especially older but less experienced, like hunters, those guys, they, they seem to be like, well, he did this because because of that, and it's like, uh, may, maybe. maybe, yeah, maybe, but like, maybe. Well, that's where I like using somebody like Shane, who has been through multiple scenarios and trails, that's just experience. He's seen them, yeah, he's seen them do it all, and he's got a tool that's way better than any you know human has in there. Well, head. and that's what I thought was really interesting because I mean, I know, and I've made a few, you know, um, you know, back liver slash gut type shots. Oh God, I livered him. Yeah. I live I yeah, that one. buck over there. Yeah. And like, you know, you don't see that deer drop in sight and you know, the wheels start turning like, what if, what if, what if, you know, and for him to say like, listen, if you don't put pressure on that deer, usually in the first few hundred yards, he's going to plop himself down. And as long as he doesn't get bumped by you, a deer, coyote, etc., that's what it'll be. And you know, it's so easy to get worked up and think, ah, oh, you know, I gut shot that deer and the rain's coming and you know, X, Y, Z, you have options out that's there. That's the big one. That's been the big one for the me, rain. Dude. And it, yeah, I can think of several deer, dude. This one right here, I made a bad shot on. Uh, the one last year that I put dad on that he hit, uh, several other deer. It just seemed because them deer move in relation to fronts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's coming or going, the chances of there being like a, a precipitation, um, you know, in and around yeah. when, when you shot that deer is pretty good. Yeah. And so, I mean, you feel the it's pressure it, to go. It, it is gone, dude. Well, you, I remember that deer. You called me. You were like on the trail and like in your head. It lamp. hadn't rained in like a month, and it was like the first the first time I saw him. It turned off. It poured. Yeah, that you're night. like, I don't know if it's this deer. I see eyes. I'm not sure. Like, and yeah. it's just then you start getting frazzled. Blood's not as good as I thought it was going to be. Hits not as good as I thought it and was. And for good reason, because dude, after it rains, yeah. what's left? You know, and it's it's nice. Uh, for I haven't had this conversation to know that like a dog is still very capable of finding that deer after yeah, a rain. That's crazy. So. That's awesome. Well, yeah, listen, we appreciate Shane Simpson coming on here. Obviously, check him out at Shane Simpson Hunting and uh, on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, he's got some really cool. I was watching some of the videos of him and Callie work some of those, and he's got a really cool detail of how, how he breaks down the track. And, you know, it's something that even as we move here into the off season. I think watching those types of videos can really benefit deer hunters to prepare for the what if happens during the season. Yeah. You know, understanding how those tracks went, understanding how those deer move, it, whether you call a dog in or not, just understanding how a wounded deer behaves is super critical as a bow hunter. Um, so we appreciate Shane coming on and appreciate everybody listening to episode 53. Uh, starting 2022 off strong. And uh, like I said in an earlier thing, you know, Leave a comment. Tell us who you want to see on there. Tag them if they've got a YouTube channel or social media. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're going to keep on chugging, man. On to the next one. All right. We'll see you next time. Later. It's take me. Oh.